Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad it's Friday. Glad I have some good coffee. So, um, yeah. So I was here yesterday, but I'm I'm Ralph Wolf. I'm the oh man, director of Native Lands and Resources. I also run the Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network, Alaska Youth Stewards, and Traditional Food Security Program at the tribe. And today we're going to be talking about the Guardians Network and traditional food security today. And sorry to say you will not end up in the same seat you're at right now. Um, I'm a very interactive person and I hope we can all be interactive today and have some good conversations. So there's gonna be a series of questions that we're gonna be doing and going through. Um, today, we're talking about salmon. I know that's not the only resource in the region, However, I feel like everybody has a story about salmon. Everybody has a connection with salmon. Everybody has something to talk about salmon. We know something that's good and something that's bad about salmon. And that's where we're going to start because the mission of our program is to bring together resources in order to help protect and build our not only our our native lands but our native resources to our area and part of that includes teaching folks proper ways to harvest and put up these resources as well as taking in not just the actual resource what was the weather like when you did it or did you catch any weird salmon i seen a yellow salmon on facebook this year completely yellow. So taking in these little knowledge pieces that you do while you're doing this are some of the things that we're going to be focusing on. And part of the work we're doing is to build out this network in order to gather this information, put it into forms of data that's useful, not only to us, but to the federal and state governments so that we can have rights as well as management aspects in resources going forward. So I think it's a very important program and it's very far reaching from, I've been here since January and I'm seeing how much overlap there is in every aspect of what Clinton and Haida does. So today we're gonna focus on salmon, um, but I already skipped part of my script here to go back. I need to introduce my team that's here with me today. And I don't know if I want to make them stand at the mic and introduce themselves and tell them what they do. I, Heather's smiling, so that's a yes. Um, so if you guys could come up. This is the team for SIGN, which we go by SIGN, Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network, and Traditional Food Security. So. And I will let them introduce themselves and what they do so I don't steal the thunder. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Heather Duvel. I'm the Regional Resource Coordinator for Clinkett and Haida, and my main responsibility is developing the Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network. Uh, good morning, uh, Claude Young, uh, Heidelberg Coordinator. Um, for traditional food security. Um, yeah, our overall goal is just to kind of protect what, um, you know, we we have uh, inherited from our ancestors and make sure that, uh, you know, this resource is there for the people to come after us, our kids. So thank you for having us and it'll be a fun morning. Uh, Anthony Christensen, traditional food uh, senior coordinator, something kind of level, I don't know. The handle doesn't matter. I live off fish. So we're here because we love the salmon, traditional foods, and harvesting has been my way of life forever. Hi, Bree. Good morning. Come on up here. I got to introduce yourself. So that's why I'm shouting out to you as part of the team. Uh, and But uh, traditional foods, I've been uh, fortunate to get this job. I spent a, a lifetime of uh, working in trying to protect our resources, document the resources, showcase the use and the patterns, distribution, demographic, you name it. Uh, because if we can't name it, somebody else will, and they'll claim it. 
And so for us here in the indigenous, you know, community, for us as salmon is the backbone of our community. For for uh, Southeast Alaska, it's also one of the biggest economic engines in the world. And so that balance, that delicate balance between harvesting, commercially harvesting for our personal use and all that's in between. So from traditional harvest perspective, we take it from, uh, you know, cultural uh, so we're trying to, to get all the traditional ecological knowledge that we can, which incorporates all of what you know, the people who live out there with resources. We're hoping to tease that out. For our program, we're looking for the ups, downs, and places we can partner. We know that one of the things that are missing in the in the state as a whole is called harvesters. So a big misconception that is if you live in Alaska, you hunt and fish. But if you live in a rural community, you'll find out like 10 people do <laughs> out of 400. And so that those people are becoming less and less. So the information and the knowledge that they carry is also dwindling. And it's important for the overall management of the subsistence resources, uh, both uh, in creating relationships with federal and state managers, as well as community relationships that open up people to discuss their hardships with you. And so we're hoping to pull all that out of here, both management, commercial, and traditional harvest, where we may partner where we may be able to identify issues that can uh, elevate to a management maybe area or places we could come in and just say, hey, let us help uh, catch your community some fish or how does that look like? Uh, uh, so it's up to uh, this group to help us tailor the next uh, strategy that we apply as a regional partner. So thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Brianna. I'm the Administrative Assistant for Traditional Food Security. I was going to make Bree say more, but she's been getting all the materials because today part of the activity is cooking stew. We're going to cook some fish stew and soup today uh, towards the end, towards lunch. So part of the conversation that I think is a, a very important aspect that Tone brought up is we're here to bring resources, right? Not necessarily money, not necessarily uh, equipment, but our time, our, our, our uh, collective thoughts and powers to like bring together different ways and, and different networks of people in order to maintain our way of life. I think that's the main thing. We're trying to maintain our way of life. And that's the, one of the big missions that we've been really put forward with. Maintaining doesn't mean just keeping, keeping the level. We want to increase it to a level that we used to have. We want to increase the numbers of salmon that are caught in the region for our people. We want to increase the number of pounds. We've seen that data from yesterday from 1997 or something like that 15 years old 18 years old uh and we want those numbers to be higher because i think you know i think about cake in the pandemic right we can't have that happen again when you think about all the communities in the region and the higher cost of food we can't have families that are struggling through that and part of our mission is to make sure that doesn't happen so there's a lot of work to be done. And I think we're really getting ready to ramp up a lot of this work. And I think, you know, part of the part of the mission behind this has started a while ago, but this is like one of our first activities as Seacoast Indigenous Guardians Network. We had a beach cleanup with Ocean Conservancy on Tuesday and Wednesday. And and Mike, Debris Mike. Marine Debris Mike had us hiking all over islands outside of Sitka. It'll be fun. It'll be easy. Should have brought boots. Should have brought a raincoat and lunch and water and more coffee. But you know what? We made it. We survived. We're here. Yeah. And we moved a lot of debris. It didn't even touch it, though. So all these different kind of activities that we're talking about are what we're going to be doing going forward. But today we're here to talk about salmon. And right now, I want us to get into four groups. Yeah, four groups. Four groups. If we could gather around four tables and we can space out chairs, however comfort level you are, if we can condense into four different tables, that would be amazing for us so that we could facilitate conversations. And I got some questions that I'll be throwing at you guys. And on a regional level, each of these questions that come that come at you here, right? Like I heard so many 
similar answers as I was walking around think when people say why we do what we do right and I and I I just get excited when I start hearing terminology about culture and and I'm not a big user of the term subsistence I like traditional harvest uh however I understand the use but I also like the realness that it can bring to a room very quickly. It takes zero time to talk about something so clearly important to us. And I think that's what we have to start doing more so that we can start looking at these resources that mean so much to us and help us protect them, right? In some, in some circles uh, that I've been at, there's, there's seats for salmon, there's seats for deer, there's seats for moose. There's seats for all of the resources, the land, the air, the sea. And I think it's important for us to bring it in. We're not gonna do that today, but it's important for us to bring them in the room with us. Sam had a jar of salmon, That's fantastic. Um, so as you're thinking about these questions, think about it for myself, for the community I live in and for the region, because it's gonna take all of us to keep these things around. It's gonna take all of us to bring them back to the abundance levels that we had before. It's gonna take all of us to collaborate together in order to make things like this happen and continue to work in a way that's meaningful, in a way that actually makes sense and in a way that'll actually work. I think we've tried a lot of different ways. And I think there's still ways that we can do a lot of these things better. So is this the best way to have a forum about this? Probably not. There's probably a way more, a way better way that we could get information from you guys. However, I feel like conversations are a very big factor in the way we do the work because you have to connect with the person next to you. You have to connect with a group of people in order to maintain a level of vigilance. So as we go forward, right? This is what I want you to think about. Those three levels. The first question, and I want you to do this this time, turn to the person next to you and have a conversation for one minute. Otherwise, we won't get through all these questions. Everybody turn to your left. Yeah, that won't work. Get a partner at your table, have a conversation, okay? Everybody get a partner on either side of you, have a conversation, Somebody go get Bria Red Bull. So, so here's the question, okay? So for one minute between the two of you, so you've got to keep track of time. The one minute, if no action is taken to protect salmon today, what will Southeast look like in a hundred years? If no action is taken today, what will salmon look like in 100 years? And go. And it can't just be down south. I want deeper. We're going to report out. So after this question, I'm going to pivot again because there's no way we're getting through all the questions we wanted to today. However, so you had a small group at your table with your small group so that we can get notes, the important part, right? So we have data to back up our conversation. I want you to, to report out what your conversation was about. Um, and I want this, this has to be quick, 30 seconds, 30 second report out for each group at your table. No questions? And it could be quick, right? So a quick report out, the big thing, the big takeaways from your conversations of your groups. I hear other conversations happening now. And I'm, and I'm trying to give everybody time to talk because it's important that everybody gets a chance to talk. So like thinking about this now, right? That took us to a dark place very quickly. I heard that. 
you got to go there to see what you can do to make it work, right? So, so like there's always been a high demand for salmon. There's always been a demand for wild caught Alaskan salmon to be particular about it. Um, part of this question is thinking about that dark place we were just at and thinking about going forward, how do we balance commercial harvest, traditional harvest um, of salmon? Thinking about that regionally, individually, community-wide. How do you think going forward that we can balance that out? Because right now it's not a maintainable harvest management. Going forward, how can we ensure there's a balance there? We got a question. Yes, there's many aspects of commercial that I need to be more specific about, right? The three big groups that we have, we have sport fishing, we have traditional harvest and commercial harvest. Those three are very big. Yeah. Just so happens that Sam's here to hear this conversation. I'm sure he's he's got some opinions, but I'm sure he'd like to hear our opinions as well. So how can we balance that? As an Alaska native, my priority should be first, is what it says in the Constitution. Is that happening right now? No. I would even beg to differ if commercial is the highest priority right now in the state on management scales. Because we just seen a commercial king harvest that got cut because of a sports harvest that was over harvested. So some things to think about. How can we move forward and balance that though? There has to be a, we have to find a way. And I think part of our work is to kind of get through these questions like this and how, the how, right? How can we make that work? How can we get data to make that work? So <laughs> we're supposed to be on question six right now. This is question two. Which means there's good questions, there's good dialogues happening. So we're going to do this one. I'm going to give you time. We have until about five after. So just about 12 minutes at your table. And I, and I think, did that talking with a group or do you want to go around in a circle? I think we have either way for this one. Let's go in the pairs. Get a pair again and, and talk about it and then we'll report out again. I'll, I'll give you the time to report out. So, so Make sure you have a yellow sticky note in this section here. And we have a bunch of those. If you need some at your table, pass them around or we can get you another pad with the big yellow sticky. One or two, just one right now. Yep. We're gonna, con we're gonna keep it to one. I'm gonna make you stay with one. So think, think your ideas down. Everybody gets a sticky. Yes, if you need a pen also. I think a lot of a lot of us have pens here, so. Okay, so the next question is. So so we went to those places earlier this morning. Now I want you to think about this before. We're not going to write this one down. There's going to be a part, second part of this question. The first part is, how can we educate and engage the public in your community and your region into understanding the importance of this balance that we talked about, the importance of the resource that we're talking about? Katie, are you confused? I'm giving you a hard time. Educate and engage. Beautiful. Fantastic.
we're going to get exactly on that little sticky, right? Okay. So first partner conversation at your table or a whole conversation at your table, whichever your table feels more comfortable with. So visuals do work. We also need data behind those visuals in order to move forward. So what part of those processes do we need? Um, how, what's the how? A lot of the times we're asking right now is the how. How do we educate people who don't understand, right? Because I have a feeling in this room, a lot of us understand the importance of salmon, but how do you communicate to the people who don't understand that? And I know we all know at least one person who doesn't understand the importance of salmon in our life. How can you communicate to that, that to them of the balance that we need in order to maintain our way of life and that balance that we just talked about? So the next part, so the next part, and this is where the sticky comes in, is now you're gonna talk about how to communicate those ideas and what tools you can use. And there's two maps, and we'd like you to stick those on the maps right now. So now you're gonna write out one or two ideas of how to communicate, and two, what kind of tools can you use to communicate those ideas? Because there's lots of different ways to do this. So think about that for a couple minutes. I'll give you about five minutes to do that one. So that's the second one. How do you communicate your ideas? What tools can you use to do that on your sticky? I know it's asking a lot to, to pare down. However, you get one sticky. One side of one sticky. So I think the one of the reasons we're trying to, to get tools and communication paths and questions and like the how from, from you guys is that's how we're gonna move forward with one is we open up and, and start moving forward with the Indigenous Guardians Network. How we reach out to these communities is through these interactions right here, forums like this, through outreach that we're starting up now of surveys and one-on-one -on -one meetings with communities and tribes through uh, a lot of Zoom, uh, I have a feeling. Um, but it's important for us to get these questions down and these tools down because that's how we wanna reach out to you all and make sure the partners and the collaborators that are here are seeing the methods that you guys have put out there so that we can reach a bigger audience to, the, to reach the people who don't understand to reach the people who we need to, to meet with the most or to work with partners and communities that already have that relationship, right? So I think it's important for us, and I wanted to emphasize on that, that we get ideas for one, but we also get different strategies that we can use going forward to, to move out and get this web cast out in a, in a good way through the networks and through harvesting, so. The last set of questions I have, um, we did one third of the questions that we wrote out today, <laughs> but um, you'll notice a couple folks stepped out because we have some salmon that we are gonna make a soup for you all with here that Tony and Claude brought up from Heidelberg. So they're outside prepping that right now. So there'll be some uh, soup coming up here in about an hour or less, a little under an hour or so. Um, so since we talked about salmon all morning, we figured we'd feed you some salmon and it won't be the last salmon. That's our mission, right? It's not the last salmon. So um, the last set of questions here, and we have about 40 minutes to get through these is, so how can we bring traditional knowledge and practices into stewardship efforts? How do we integrate that? 
tough question. Question number one. How do we integrate traditional knowledge and practices because part of it is the doing. That's the connection where we get that from is the actual providing of sustenance for families, but it's so much more than that. It's family time, it's sharing, it's making sure everybody makes it through the winter, right? It's all of those things. How do we integrate that into our stewardship effort, efforts going forward? I'll leave that one. We'll, we'll ask the other questions later. So there's your question for now. And I'll, I'll get back on. So I think <clears throat> I'm hearing Tony start to talk about the next part of the question. So thinking about the the knowledge and practices and integrating this into stewardship and the efforts that are happening around the region, you know, I heard earlier, I heard this, I think I, I think I heard this economic implications of salmon. I thought I heard someone say that it might have been Sam earlier talking about it just so happens that's another question that we have because it's an important aspect, right? And Tony was kind of hitting on it just there about like outward migration of permits and the added increase of harvest access and uh, the implementation, implementation of uh, over harvesting resources close to places, right? Because that's happening in a lot of places now where it used to be spread out harvest over many streams and runs and kind of helped spread that impact out. Also, the number of people have grown, right, that, that, that rely on these. So thinking about, right, the regional, individual, and community impacts of this, what do you think economic implications that we're seeing now are, and if we look to a more sustainable harvest, how would that change the resource management? What would we have to change to make that happen, to maintain a sustainable harvest? We've been tiptoeing around this, how do you change that? Like, what do we have to do right now to make this resource stay and to help sustain, right? Because we understand Alaska is a fishing state. The commercialization of salmon has changed Alaska, just like timber, just like mining. But now there's a lot of activism. There's a lot of agencies, there's a lot of partners that want to look at this in a different way. How? How do we do this? Tony's laughing. Tony has the answer already. Well, well, well like you said, I would say start to eat monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the monkey for when she dies, though. How do we maintain sockeye salmon harvests? and resources. Great answer. That's one way. But I think there's just so many different aspects of it, right? So that's the next part of that's this next conversation. We got about 20 minutes for this one. So whole table conversation on this last one, then we'll come back together and wrap up our morning of conversations. So thank you so much. They're outside chefing it up after you get done with this. You can go look and it'll be ready in about 40 minutes or so. Let's start the back. Okay. So before 
everyone takes off for lunch if they're not going to stick around for some salmon soup. Um, I think a couple things that we really wanted to point out was, first of all, thank you for the great conversations. There was a lot of great conversation happening around at every table. There was interaction, which was what I go for. I really like interaction to happen and communication to happen across lines that sometimes there's not always space for that and with people who we always don't get in the same room with. So I think the important aspect of that is definitely part of the work that we're trying to do and incorporate here. And I think thinking about some of these questions and how we move forward with thinking about resource management, collaboration, um, stewardship, and going forward with those kind of thoughts in mind, be on the lookout for more from us at Indigenous Guardians, be on the lookout for uh, more forums like this and ways to interact like this. Um, and they definitely will not be the same every time. So um, part of me is making sure that we have different methods for collecting because not everybody can just talk and not everybody can just write. So finding that balance of how we share stories, right? We, we talked about that, right? Also finding the, the balance of everybody has ideas and we need to really figure out how we bring those ideas together and combine them to make the really great ideas where a lot of the work happens. A lot of the work is gathering information, but also how do we put it forward to a meaningful way? And I'm super excited that Sam got to stop in for these conversations, because I think that's really gonna go a long way, realistically. I'm glad that all of you decided to stay here for this because I was nervous because it's Friday on the last day of the forum, but it's the only day that we could make this happen. So uh, we had a marine debris cleanup in Sitka that we did Tuesday and Wednesday that went amazing and we're planning more, more of that. And you're gonna see posts coming from that here from our, our website, which is gonna be live, I think today. As, as far as like our social media, that's going to be live today as well for Guardians. So a very big day for us to, to get out off the ground and a big week of activities. I'm trying to, can you grab Tone for a sec? Um, but I think the way, I want to see if Tony has anything he wants to say because he's really good at wrapping up. But as you're sitting here waiting for that, I want you to think about like two words this is taking me back to my SSP. Two words about how you feel today. Did it in, is invigorating you? Did you uh, a two-word description about your morning here? I'll give you three. Three words. Three-word description about how our conversations went this morning about salmon. And we kind of talked about salmon. We talked about management. We talked about uh, impacts, economy. We talked about a lot of things, but it was all based around salmon, right? Like we could talk about that, about seaweed, about kelp, about many other things, but salmon was the focus. Three words, and everyone's going to go around the room and say their three words. We'll do that before Tony comes back. I think he had to go wash his hands because he's working on salmon out there. Um, and I will start on my left over here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name right here. It, it, yes, Flannery. Okay, three words. The conversations today, how how they make you feel. Inspired, hopeful, and appreciative.
grateful. You don't have to come up with three. You can give one or two. Knowledgeable. You got one. No one alone. Okay. Three words. Uplifting and empowering. Thoughtfulness and heard. Gratitude and community. Yeah. I'm going to pop back real quick. Fill them in. Fill them in. Informative. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Not to put you on the spot, but I did. <laughs> Sam in his life. Inspired, knowledgeable, resilience. <laughs> Technically, okay, that works. Lightning, hopeful, and exciting. Thank you. Awareness and worthwhile. And what was the last one? Decision making. Very cool. Yeah. Grateful for collaboration. There we go. We did go dark. Yeah, we went dark to start. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Mr. Jones. Oh, <laughs> Hey, 
So I.O. is what we say when we see them jump, right? And I can tell you the story real quick where it comes from. Do it. We're waiting for food. Okay. It's a salmon uh, boy, right? So we respect our food and the village is starving because we're talking about disappearing uh, resources. And so this Donna had a little bit of uh, moldy fish she had saved up and it was dry. And so she shared it with her grandson because it was the last piece of fish she had. Well, the grandson took it down to the beach and looked at the moldy fish and he couldn't bring himself to eat it and so he threw it into the a hole in the rock and he watched it swell up and he fill he seen it fill a hole in the rock and then he had regret because it swelled up and he couldn't eat it for the salt water so he couldn't eat it right so he was his stomach was full and he remembered all the teachings about be respectful remember that it's all your thoughts and don't be talking bad like i just spoke about and so he's sitting there thinking about it and his mistakes he made and he looks up and two uh, young gentlemen are walking up the beach. And hey, and they have a conversation and pretty soon, hey, we got lots of food, come home with us. And so he follows the two young men down the beach and they walk a long time. And all of a sudden they come to this other village. And in that village, uh, you notice there's so many of them. You never see this many people in his life. Like, it must have been a million. He's wondering, oh, I've never seen this many people. Well, they had a celebration in Long House going on. You could hear the drum beat. You could hear the people celebrating and um, going on and on and on. And they go in and they celebrate more food than you could ever see. It's like a height of pod life, right? Anything you want, all you can eat. So the boys eat and they get full and they go to sleep by the fire that night. He goes to sleep. And the next day, they're continuing the party and the food continues to grow. It's all you can eat. Third day, he's full, but now he's getting lonesome. He wants to go home. Yeah, he ate lots. His mind's thinking about the community, his grandma, who he left. They must be starving. Uh, so all this stuff's going through. So he asks the boy, and he finds the boy in all of the big long house and says, uh, I want to go home. And he's like, I'm full. I miss my family. And uh, the boy says, well, you can't do that. Um, you're, you're one of us now. What do you mean I'm one of us? And he starts to look around and he starts to notice that people have a different characteristics to them. And the closer he looks, he realizes it's different type of people that are transformed into these people, right? So where he thought himself was with the salmon people, because they had disrespected his species, they took him home to their own place. And they basically told him, uh, you're one of us now. Well, winter came and went, and he spent uh, two winters with them. And, uh, oh, get the canoes ready. This one day, the two stand up. Tom just sitting on the front porch. Long hops. Get ready. We're taking off now. We're going to take off and load up the canoes. And thousands of canoes head out from the village. Thousands. You can't even see the end of the canoe. Never seen a nation as big as this. How rich they must be. So they're paddling and paddling and paddling. And all the canoes are filled up with all these people. And uh, so they get close, and he recognizes they're right towards the river, the home river. And he looks down the beach, and there's his grandmother standing on the edge of the beach. And he sees her, and he stands, he's in the canoe paddling, and he sees that the chief adopted him as a son. And he sees his grandma. So he's in the canoe paddling, and he jumps up. Hey! And she looks out, and she sees him. And she gets all excited. Oh, my goodness. Boom, he jumps up again. Grandma, Nana. Oh, Lord. turns and she runs up the beach. Where are you going? And he's taking a big old fuss and he keeps on jumping up and down. I know, she says. I know. He had turned into a sandwich. And so he thought he'd seen his grandma, right? And she didn't recognize him because he had turned into a sandwich. And so his heart's broken, and the chief explains to him again. He told you, you know, what happened. They go around the corner and start heading up the river. Well, his grandma had given him a sharpening stone uh, as a gift, as every little height of boy should have a sharpening stone to keep each other And so she's at the river, and she's on her gear, and she's harvesting salmon. 
And she harvests the salmon, and she notices that on the neck of the salmon, well, she harvests it because the story is the boy seeing his grandma standing on the side of the river fishing. So he swam over to her and said, Hey, grandma, right here. And he jumped again, right into her neck. Well, grandma bumped the poor fish on the head. So grandson essentially got bumped over the head by grandma. And as she's cutting the fish, she cuts into the stone on his neck. It's the stone that she gave her to start from his neck. So she knows that's her grandson now because that's the unique stone I gave her. And so she goes to the town shaman and this is my lost grandson. And so he gives instruction on how to return the son back to his human form and hang it from the eaves and the raindrops will strip away the skin of the salmon and the son will return. Uh, so the son was returned, but he didn't live uh, because oh, he was transformed into the salmon boat because the salmon boat floated. And so uh, they returned the body and had to do the proper burial and had to close it, which is so important for us in our culture, right? You lose somebody, your mind never really sinks. So it means that the, the doctor, the salmon, was able to bring closure to the salmon and adopt that salmon as um, the crest. And so that's the long story and short, right, of, of that. And in that, uh, the story also has about returning everything back to where you got it, right? And so built in a part of that story was some other people that didn't return everything to where they got it. And one guy left an uh, eyeball in the bush. The next day, the guy was blind. So the stories we have are about how we have to pull that relationship with the sand and how balanced we have to be in respecting it so that we don't misuse, disrespect, or uh, find ourselves uh, yeah, walking around the beach and turning into things that we don't want. So, respect your fish. Lunch is done. Don't be shy. All right, thank you everyone. Um, thanks for coming back after lunch. Uh, had a really great session this morning. I know uh, we're gonna wrap up, wrap up the day with uh, this afternoon session. Uh, we have some really great things planned for this afternoon as well. Um, but uh, we're gonna get started here uh, with uh, Diana Robinson. She's with the CBJ, the city of Borough of Juneau. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself, but um, this is just a great opportunity to to have some represent representatives from uh, CBJ to kind of give us some updates on the projects that they're working on, uh, other uh, updates um, and highlights. But uh, yeah, thanks for being here, Diana. Here you go. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Diana Robinson. I am the environmental project specialist for the city and borough of Juneau, which is a uh, relatively new role that uh, was created last year. Um, I work in the engineering and public works department and we were starting to have a lot more environmentally conscious initiatives and projects in the works. So they decided that they needed a full-time person for that. And here I am. Is this, can I use this? Okay. Where do I need to point it? Okay. Ah, there you go. <laughs> okay, yes, please. No, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so um, our group of elected officials, the Juno Assembly, um, have committed to making sustainability uh, a priority for the city. Um, it is even in one, it is, number five of their five overarching goals, uh, as you can see here. All right, go ahead and progress. Uh, solid waste, which <laughs> is kind of the the major, major field that I'm working on. Um, if any of you live in Juneau, you know that we have a landfill in the middle of town. It's very, very obvious for everyone driving past on Egan. Um, and we, we have some pretty exciting things in the works for the city. Uh, earlier this year, we were awarded uh, $2.5 million for a compost facility 
through Senator Mikowski's office. Um, and we uh, almost immediately after applied for EPA's solid waste infrastructure for recycling grant uh, for another $4 million because uh, this sort of infrastructure is not cheap and we're really hoping we can, we can do it right to start. Um, and we're also working with uh, the single composting business here in town that services uh, businesses, residents. She does curbside pickup, Juno Compost. She leases a part of CBJ land for her operations. And we wrote a USDA, uh, oh, I put the wrong <laughs> acronym in there. It's a food waste reduction cooperative agreement to get her some site improvements um, just so she can increase her capacity. Um, and all of this is going to be a larger part of our zero waste planning. Um, we hope to build what's called a solid waste subdivision is what we're tentatively calling it. It'll have uh, smaller operations, what'll be kind of a mini transfer station where people can bring their recycling, they can bring their food waste. Um, in the future, we might have a reuse center, a repair center, basically things to help keep materials that are still useful in the community instead of in the landfill or shipping them south, which I know a lot of other Southeast communities have to do. Next slide, please. Uh, and just a little 101, because Juno is a little bit unique in that uh, the city doesn't really have a stake in the game of um, just general municipal solid waste, which is just the stuff coming out of your house. So there is a public utility that is held by Alaska Waste, which is our sole waste hauler here in town. And then the landfill is privately owned by waste management. And we actually contract through waste management and another company called Clean Harbors to do our recycling center, junk vehicle program, and household hazardous waste collections. So we are, which that's all located within the landfill, but uh, you know, it is not an official landfill waste management program. That is a city program, but we, if you can see down by the regulated by, we're, we're not amongst those. So really we are not very involved with this whole process. Next slide, please. Or she step away. <laughs> Giving it to work. Uh, I will just keep talking then. Um, we are, some something else that we are doing, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we're, we just put out a request for proposals um, for what's called a waste characterization study. And for those not familiar, that is basically uh, somebody to go through, it's a systematic way to go through the trash to see what you know proportions of food waste are in there, recyclables, non-recyclables. Um, and it can tell us, you know, there, there will be some slight deviation from the national averages on that, but this is mostly so that we can have a baseline set of info to uh, build our programs off of, um, including composting, more recycling, that sort of thing. Uh, and like I said earlier, we do not control Juno's waste stream and we don't control or own the landfill. Uh, and just a few little points about that, our recycling facility that's at the landfill is pretty much maxed out uh, in terms of capacity. So our diversion rate for Juno is 10%, which is um, lower than we'd like, but we, we've heard from our uh, recyclers that we do an excellent job at it. So I'll, I'll take quality over quantity in that, in that regard. Uh, and we're really limited by staff constraints, which I think everybody is, you know, we're all hurting for folks with CDLs and the ability to drive equipment. Um, so hopefully, you know, those are pretty solvable issues, but it, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, and obviously rising fuel costs, rising costs for everything means that recycling just costs more now. And also, and this is kind of a general problem that I know Southeast has overall, is that our population is just very small and logistically it makes it uh, expensive to recycle at all because we're sending just a little bit of material down South for just a little bit of money. Um, and then food waste, which is, you know, a lot of people are aware that food waste is a huge chunk of the waste stream. 
uh, estimates are something between 25 to 40 percent, depending on which federal agency you're talking to. Uh, and although we have a, a great uh, small business here in town, it's an expensive thing to get into. The infrastructure is really expensive, and to scale up to a citywide, you know, facility is going to require federal funding, which is uh, what I mentioned earlier. And we're also going to be limited by the amount of carbon sources we have. So ironically, despite all of the, the trees we have around, um, we don't have a lot of like leaf waste or just brush from people's yards that uh, tend to come through. Um, folks like to burn it, they use it for other things. They just don't, you know, they just leave nature to be nature. There's a variety of reasons. Um, and then with our seasonal population from tourism, you know, we, we see a huge bump in things like furniture, mattresses, cleaning supplies. You know, when folks are moving out of town, they can't take everything, they leave it behind. And oftentimes that ends up either on the side of the road or in the landfill. So we'd like to be able to divert those perfectly good materials, maybe for next year's uh, tourism uh, workforce. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is uh, just a overview. If you guys know where Home Depot and Costco is, uh, Juno Compost is up there with the green dot. And then that larger area in purple, that's the tentative location of our future zero waste subdivision and compost facility. It's the old Lemon Creek gravel pit. Uh, and it's one of the few industrially zoned areas left in Juno. Next slide, please. All right. We have more than just solid waste though. Uh, transportation, uh, some of you may know that we purchased a electric bus a few years ago um, from Proterra and it, and it came with a lot of issues. Um, it, it hasn't operated since last November. It just is not equipped to deal with a cold climate. It, so that is it's paid for by federal funding and we're hoping to be able to make some kind of use out of it, but really it is just not appropriate for this climate. So we, we kind of took lessons learned from that and um, our, our next generation of electric buses uh, that are, they're used in other areas in Canada. So we know that they're gonna do just fine here. Uh, and we're just waiting for those to be produced. There's a big backlog of that because everybody wants electric buses. And uh, hopefully those will be out on the road in October of 2024. Um, another initiative that we, that goes along with the electric buses is uh, at our Valley Transit Center and then at the city bus barn, which is where our, um, like the buses fuel up, uh, we're gonna be having the charging infrastructure for those EV buses. Um, the Juno visi Visitor Circulator, which will, once that's up, it'll probably be an electric bus. Um, that's just to kind of move people around town from the cruise ship docks to to move them to other areas of town a little bit easier and to reduce the burden that's on our public transit system because right now a lot of tourists use those buses and kind of they get pretty full in the summer and it causes issues with our folks who rely on buses to get around town. So hopefully that'll kind of reduce some of those pressures. Uh, the city has five passenger EVs that we use in our fleet just for you know, going across town for meetings and just CBJ business. Uh, and we are in the process of funding our cruise ship docks uh, electrification. Um, we have 5 million that's already been devoted, but we need a total of 24 or 25 million. So we are looking for more federal funding for that. And um, that, that's, a, that's a big push that goes along with a, a larger program called the Green Corridor, which probably most of you know about in this room. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, CBJ also has funded and installed a number of publicly accessible EV chargers. They're, the whole network is free here in town uh, and we just submitted a $5 million grant application for additional chargers um, with a, a particular focus on multifamily dwellings because, you know, People that live in apartments and condos, they, they don't really have the opportunity like single family homeowners do to install their own charging infrastructure. So we're, we're trying to you know, make EVs more accessible to everyone, have a little more equitable kind of uh, charging infrastructure for that. 
and we're also pursuing uh, five DC FC fast chargers. So those those are like those super lightning fast ones, like you're stopping at a gas station. Uh, those are obviously much more expensive. So we're just piloting a handful of those to start. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we also, as part of our just kind of normal uh, deferred maintenance and uh, capital improvement project plans, uh, are integrating energy efficiency upgrades in that. Uh, a lot of those are things like, you know, switching over to LED lighting, um, whole building energy management systems, ground heat pumps, electric boilers, uh, new windows, new roofs, all, all of your, your basic energy efficiency upgrades um, has be, become just normal operating procedure within CBJ's engineering department, which is really great. Uh, and two, two of the, the most recent projects are the Juno Airport, which is still ongoing, and Ock Bay Elementary School, uh, and we installed ground source heat pumps for, for both of those, which is pretty great. Next slide, please. Okay, we also have uh, worked with Alaska Heat Smart a lot in the past, providing them tech support, some outreach education, um, and matching funds for low-income houses uh, to be able to get heat pumps installed. And that's just an ongoing thing that, that we do when funding's available and we can help out. Next slide, please. Okay, and I apologize for this graph. That's the only one I could get uh, <laughs> in short notice. Uh, so very recently, uh, we finalized our um, greenhouse gas emission inventory from 2021. CBJ had performed two, one in 2007 and one in 2010. And then I'm not entirely sure why they stopped for a while, but uh, they, they picked it back up after the pandemic. And uh, we were pleased to see that we actually met some of our goals, which was basically a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Uh, well, actually, not just from transportation, from everywhere across the city um, by, I think it was 2030 or 2035. And we've already hit that, which is really great. So we'll be looking to bump up that goal here in the future. Um, and a really great thing that's gonna come out of this that's not quite up yet is we're gonna have an interactive dashboard that'll have every individual building in town and you can see you know if you have a gas boiler this is how much um, greenhouse gas emissions it produces every year if you subbed it out with a heat pump here's how much you'd be saving every year that sort of thing so just kind of a nice helpful tool for people to kind of visualize uh, you know energy savings um, reducing costs reducing emissions for their own homes and uh, it's on our Engineering and Public Works website, if you'd like to check it out. It's very technical and long though, I will warn you. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, wastewater treatment. Um, this is kind of one of those things that I feel like gets left out of the sustainability talks sometimes. Uh, Juno has three wastewater treatment facilities, the Mendenhall Wastewater Treatment Facility, which is kind of by the airport, Juno Douglas, which is over in Douglas, and the Ock Bay Wastewater Treatment Facility that's uh, just on the other side of the harbor. And, you know, it's it's kind of a interesting system because if you think about typical cities, they're kind of, they're everything's next to each other. So you have fewer miles of pipelines that you have to install. Ours is very complex because we're coming, we have, gosh, how many miles? 140 miles of pipes for this town, uh, which is, it's a lot. And it means a lot of upkeep and maintenance and frankly, a lot of, uh, our water rates just go into upkeep and maintenance for these facilities. Um, the Mendenhall Wastewater Treatment Facility in particular, um, next slide please, sorry, uh, has, has a lot of uh, load issues. So it, it really services the majority of the residents and also a lot of the um, businesses, restaurants, Alaskan brewing, the landfill is actually connected to the wastewater treatment facility. We treat the leachate that comes off of that. Um, oh, only one click. Will you push the arrow button again? I think there's another image that, okay, thank you. Okay. And so kind of two of the, one of the big things that we're starting to do some re outreach about um, under the idea of source control, which is reducing 
nutrients and fats, oils and greases that enter into the sewer system. Uh, as you can see, they fill up our pipes. That, so that photo on the bottom right, that is just from people pouring grease down their drains. That's, that's what happens. They, they end up in what's called fatbergs <laughs> and they cause a lot of issues, not just for moving materials to the treatment facilities, but also it, uh, you know, they're delicate chemical balances. We have microbes in there that, you know, uh, eat the waste and turn it into something that we can treat and then discharge again. So by having a lot of these nutrients in the wastewater, it actually throws off the balance that they need to do their job. So it's really important for us to figure out a way that we can rebalance this and uh, maybe find some, you know, solutions for our larger industrial users, but also just um, starting some outreach and education to residents about, you know, uh, you, you, a lot of people, I, when I moved here, I have a um, garbage disposal in my sink and I thought, fantastic. I, you know, just rinse things down there and grind it and away it goes. But then I found out that uh, we, sh the city of Juneau, Juneau specifically, because of our limitations, we really shouldn't be using our, uh, our disposals at all. Uh, everything should be composted or thrown away. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we, we have other sustainability issues um, also. You know, the more efficient our processes are, the less energy we use, the fewer materials in the form of chemicals we're using, and the fewer biosolids, frankly, that we need to dry. And then we actually ship all of our biosolids to Oregon. Um, we... Some of you may have heard of the dryer that we purchased a few years ago. The intent was to put the biosolids in the landfill kind of as inert waste, but the state of Alaska instituted some uh, PFAS levels that prevented that from happening, and we're still kind of trying to work out a better solution, hopefully composting them in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this is uh, this is just specifically the Mendenhall Wastewater Treatment Plant. So you can really see it, it, it gets most of the, the big businesses that, you know, use sinks, use fryers. Um, there's, you know, restaurants in the Valley that have fried food, right? So th this has really been our problem area is this uh, treatment plant. So this is really the area that we're focusing for our outreach and education. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is a little, this is kind of wordy. This is just a, a little more about um, that source control I was I was talking about. So it's basically just to, you know, the objectives of it are to protect our workers, protect the community, uh, protect the process to, again, keep those rates low, as low as we can, and then protect the environment. We just, you know, uh, if we have sewer overflows, then this, this can be a problem in the environment also. And then, yeah, so residents, significant industrial users, and food service establishments are kind of the three target groups that we are working on outreach for. Next slide, please. Uh, and these are just kind of examples of some of the messaging messages we've been using. Um, you know, instead of pouring your, your grease down the drain, put it in a can. I think a lot of people probably already do that with bacon grease, right? You put it in a steel can, and then when it solidifies, you put it in the trash. Uh, we also accept used cooking oil at our household hazardous waste facility for free. So if you have it, take it there. Uh, and also so, some of the smaller stuff can be composted, but again, you'll need to speak with your composter uh, of choice. If you are doing it at home, uh, you don't want to add too much because that's going to throw off the balance of your pile. But um, in, in little bits and pieces, that can go in your compost bucket. But before you do it, I would talk to uh, Juno Compost about it. <laughs> uh, scraping off your plates, another good one. You know, we often think just rinse it off in the sink as we're washing it. If you have visible food on there, if you just wipe it off and put that paper towel in, again, the compost or the trash, that actually does help a lot. Um, and catching food scraps, just once again, don't use your garbage disposal. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of one of the messages we put out last year um, that we're trying to do a little more frequently to keep in everybody's uh, fresh in people's minds. Okay, next slide, please. Maybe, yeah, that's it. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I can take any questions if anybody has them. Yeah. Testing, testing. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Can you, I just had a couple like clarifying questions from your presentation. For sure. The waste subdivision that you were talking about, mm -hmm. is that going to be city led? Like CBJ is going to own and operate that? Or are you going to, yes. is that going to be like waste management or privately owned? No, that will be owned and operated by the city. Okay. What's going to happen to the electric bus that is not working now? Are you planning on selling that to a community down South or is it? So yeah, we, we were trying to, and then the, uh, the business was actually, it's, uh, the company's called Proterra. They were actually going to buy it back from us and then they went bankrupt. So, <laughs> uh, which, you know, kind of, I think says a lot right there. Um, I don't know if any of you saw in the Juno empire, uh, and KTOO, but, uh, there are tentative plans to maybe use it as a warming shelter. If we can't find a better solution, um, over the winter, if any of you saw that we're, we're having trouble finding someone to run our warming shelter um, for for our uh, housing insecure community. And it's, it's you know, we can hook it up to, you know, electricity there and just operate it that way and keep it warm. That's, like I said, that is our, interesting not our first choice, but we have it. And other places down South have used, used buses in the past, so. Um, can, I have a question myself, can CBJ, yeah. Is it in your authority to mandate that cruise ship companies, et cetera, also convert to using electric buses? Because I think that's one of our main complaints is yeah. like the bus traffic, et cetera. Yeah. And yes, I know that that is a, and we are, there's come kind of a few different ways that I know. And this is, um, we have a tourism manager that she's amazing, and but she is very up to date with everything going on with the cruise ships. Um, and I think the last I heard from her was the possibility of maybe having like a cutoff date for, you know, no buses older than X year or, you know, 10 years old, just because we've noticed that, uh, you know, the old buses kind of come to Juno to die, right? And they get used by the cruise ships and those are definitely the stinkiest, most polluting buses. So yeah, we're trying, we're, we're definitely trying to figure out a way to do that while- So you're looking for like a voluntary agreement? You're not do you, is it like in your regulatory authority to uh, to say, gosh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely certain. Okay. Um, I had a, one more question about your slide about Juno meeting its greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Um, I was unsure if you meant CBJ or if you meant Juno as a city had I met meant, its greenhouse yes, gas. Juno as a city. Okay. Uh, we do have CBJ buildings in there kind of as a separate little, you know, item because we're obviously very interested in the performance of our buildings. And we also have all of the data for, you know, fuel use for the buildings, uh, private, private bi buildings, you know, we obviously don't know how much people use to heat every year. So it's a little more of a guess, but we, we worked with a company called Constellation uh, that they, they do this. This is just what they do. They, they work with municipalities to help uh, provide uh, greenhouse gas emission inventories. So they, they have all sorts of modeling they've used from their years of doing this in other places. And, uh, you know, we got information directly from AEL and P, which is great. Um, some, I, I think we got, we were able to get like total fuel that was being brought in. Uh, obviously, again, not like individual use, but just because it goes through our, our docks, right? So we, we just have a record of it. Um, it yeah. And uh just other things that we can kind of quantify, like the landfill, for example, the landfill is a provider of emissions. And yeah, so there, there's a variety of stuff. It gets really, really deep into the details. Um, if you have interest, I highly recommend. It's just on the, the juno.gov. And then if you go to the engineering departments page, I think it's like on the banner right at the top. Last question about yeah. the composting facility, because I know that's kind of uh, a hot topic here yeah. for a lot of people. Are you guys like actively working with Juno Compost in your new facility and all the grants and stuff that you received? Um, have you talked about expanding their facility or partnering with them? What if, my other question is like, Juno and a lot of people here, we eat a lot of meat. And right now, like Juno Compost does not accept 
that type of organic waste, which I think is like a big component yeah. that is being missed out. Is there any uh, idea for expanding composting, et cetera, in Juneau? Going yeah. Forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Um, so the way that CBJ does these types of programs, and we do this with our recycling and household hazardous waste, we build the facility and then we contract out the operation of the facility to a private company. You know, we keep saying we don't want to be in the business of composting, right? That's like I said, we have staffing issues like everybody, and that's just one less thing that we can give in the hands of professionals to, to accomplish for us with, you know, goals and milestones and all that that stuff. Uh, so that will be a public process. Uh, currently, you know, Juno Compost is the only, the only game in town. Um, she definitely has the most experience for this climate. Um, she's got a lot of great knowledge. Uh, it's, it, it's just going to be part of a public process. Um, one of those grants that I mentioned, the USDA cooperative agreement one, that was the only one because because federal funding, I mean, we're government. So we we have particular rules for, you know, contracting with people that we need to follow. So and the federal the federal funding is even more stringent about that than than we are. So um, they they really don't like it when you write a grant and you say, I'm going to help this private business to build a new facility, right, as a government. Uh, but the USDA cooperative agreement, it was a different kind of grant. So we were able, that's the one that we applied for to help improve uh, Juno Compost site. Um, you know, the, the thought we have right now is that, you know, we'll put it out to bed, Juno Compost or another uh, company that meets all of the qualifications and can, you know, provide the end service, uh, they'll, they'll be operating it. Um, but our intent is to pull out as much organic waste as we possibly can. That includes biosolids. That's going to include meat, fish, stuff from commercial fishing. We're going to, yeah, as much as we possibly can. Um, and I, I think part of the reason that Juno Compost doesn't do that, uh, partly it's because of wildlife, right? Um, you got to can stop those bears from coming in. But uh, another thing is just the size of her site means that she can't build big enough piles to get them hot enough. And you need to meet certain temperatures to be able to break that stuff down. So, but yes, we 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 want to be able to compost everything we possibly can. Um, it's probably going to be a phased approach because again, funding being how funding is. So do you have the uh, do you have cooperation with the community? with the uh, local grocery stores um are they aware of the rfp going out i think three o'clock right and now you got it yeah the yep the pre-proposal meeting if anybody's interested you, uh yeah is at three o'clock um i will also be on that uh we you know we've informally talked to some of the grocery stores um right now the the bigger ones like fred meyer and safeway uh they actually have this program where they if they don't have a local recycler they have like corporate mandates for diversion and so whatever they cannot locally recycle or compost. They put in these boxes and they ship it south and then it yeah. gets, yeah. Right. So I, you know, informally talking to them, they're very interested in obviously not paying that cost. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I just did a uh, composition for Safeway. Oh yeah, it's easier, so, you know. Right, so um, <laughs> so another one is what do you, do you anticipate, how many uh, pounds are you anticipating annually that would be coming out of Juno? Uh, and is that what they're looking for in the waste characteristic study? Uh, yeah, so that'll be, yeah, the, the the biggest thing that we'd really like is to be able to quantify that um, organics number, uh, because that's going to help determine what kind of technology and, you know, what size facility we need. Um, we have an estimated 12,000 tons of organic waste um, in the Juno community. Uh, sorry? Yes. Food waste, green waste. Um, again, that is estimates based on other people's estimates of things. So that's one reason we're doing the waste characterization study. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we suspect more, and of course, there's going to be a seasonal change um, in the summer and the winter, just based on our population, right? Uh, yeah, I think um, to start with, we'd really like to once we get the it up and running we'd like to be able to to do 1500 pounds within the first couple of years and just you know this is kind of 
composting is a little trial and error, so it's going to require some fine tuning. So once we kind of have that baseline, we're hoping to scale up from there. And you know, we we're not entirely sure where we're going to start yet. It might be CBJ institutions where we have a little more control, like the the schools, the hospital, um, things like that, and then you know, expand it to more once we get our feet under us, basically. What's your like long, so we have this composting, what's your long-term goal for this? What do we, what is CBJ's goal for the compost? Is it going to go to community gardens? Is it going to be sold back to junior residents? Like what's the end product? Yeah. And goal? that'll be, that's going to require a little bit of uh, economic feasibility studying, you know, um, right now CBJ subsidizes recycling and household hazardous waste. And we anticipate something like that's going to happen with compost too. Um, you know, these aren't hugely, hugely profitable businesses to get into, right? Um, and we know that we're definitely going to require some for city projects because we do bring in a lot of materials from elsewhere just for parks and rec. And I mean, you see all the greenhouses that we have around town. Uh, and I'm sure we do some kind of partnership with the community gardens. Um, I'm a member of the Juno Gardening Club and everyone was very excited about more local compost. So I know, you know, there's just home gardeners are very excited. Uh, and it might be, you know, a subsidized rate that we are able to provide that way. Um, but like I said, that's a little bit of a question mark right now, just because we're not, we're not even sure how we're going to, you know, are we going to roll out full scale, uh, curbside pickup? Is it just going to be drop off? You know, there's a, there's a lot of details to be worked out, which, um, yeah, <laughs> we'll be forthcoming. <laughs> Uh, White Horse has a phenomenal pickup compost program with their garbage pickup and the residents have uh, ability to go pick up free dirt from their facility um, because of that. Just they might be a good model. Yeah, I've heard really great things about White Horse. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can get up there to check it out. An excuse to go to White Horse. But... I got enough time for one more question here. And I have my business cards on the table. If you guys, uh, I'm I'm actually going to be out of town the next three weeks, but send me an email, give me a call. I'm happy to chat with anybody about any of this. I was <clears throat> wondering how Juno expanded its infrastructure in uh, sewage treatment to support an additional 10,000 passengers a day. And then I also understood that the treatment plant, the Mendenhall one, was damaged in the flood? The, the treatment plant? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, luckily, it was pretty minimal damage. We, we were able to get operations going back up and running pretty quickly. There were a few lift stations that were damaged. Um, I think those have been addressed, uh, thankfully, now. Um, the cruise ship passenger thing, um, I'm not, I'm a, you know, I moved here about a year ago, so I'm a little newer to the ins and outs of the cruise ship stuff, but I know that we had a MOU a few years ago, uh, with them. And a big part of that was about waste and wastewater. And, uh, basically they need to deal with their own wastewater, first of all. And then we severely reduce the amount of waste that they could bring to this landfill in that MOU. And so far from what I hear, they are honoring that. But again, this is a, really about as much as I know um, on that front. In that same line, in terms of air emissions, how does the CBJ protect the city from both the hundreds of diesel buses that are traveling all day long and the tonnage of emissions in the downtown area? in regard to the Clean Air Act and the air we breathe? Uh, I, again, stuff I don't really, I don't know a ton of about. Um, I know that there were air emission studies there in the harbor here downtown, and they didn't find significant raised levels of anything. I, I think this was a number of years ago through DEC. Um, and so I, I'm not entirely sure about more details on that. Um, in terms of trying to reduce those emissions, though, that's part of why we're hoping to electrify all the docks in town. Is so that instead of you know using fuel, they're able to have a, a resource to come charge the cruise ship, as opposed to, you know, burning fuel to do that. 
Yes, that's in regard to shore power, but they still run diesel engines that burn 30,000 gallons in one hour. And those are the emissions that we're breathing and that's going into the air and that's creating the acid rain um, pretty much everywhere, but it's very significant in Skagway, it's visible. Yeah, it's like like I said, I I need to get more better versed in this. I've been mostly devoted to waste issues since I I got here. Um, I know another initiative as part of that green corridor uh, process is uh, hydrogen fuel cells for the cruise ships, um, and they're trying to develop that, and that should also reduce that amount of um, diesel that they use just for regular operations um, in the future. But hydrogen fuel is a little bit a little bit cutting edge, so that might take longer than we'd all prefer, I think. But, uh, Alex Pierce is the name of our tourism manager. Uh, she is very well versed in all of this. If you ever have any questions, I know she'd be happy to speak to you about it too. I should have brought her card, but I forgot. <laughs> Lori, thank you, Diana. And like she mentioned, she uh, has her contact info here. Um, if Reach out to myself or even her for, uh, for today. Um, but yeah, great discussion. I thank you for being here and uh, sharing and yeah, we hope to sir. keep the conversation going forward. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. And I think, uh, just like I said, just to kind of keep that, uh, momentum going, uh, we have another presenter here coming up next, uh, uh, Jonathan with, uh, Totemic Solutions. Uh, I'd like to welcome him up and, uh, uh, offer him his time to uh, to share with us some of the information uh, regarding composting. Um, but yeah, all great things. I know that's a hot topic, especially around Southeast Alaska now, uh, getting this compost programs and uh, all those sorts. Thanks, Jim. We don't have to go No, it's okay. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short because I know we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of, oh, well then, you will be punished. Um, yeah, good enough, Uh uh, Aquan, right, for the time to be able to be here this morning was incredible. Um, those, uh, I'd really like to see, sir, and, and Klinkin and Haida, if, you know, even like a discussion right now, you asked me to speak, but I would feel way better if we did something similar like this morning, where we actually can just have group discussions on some of these heavy topics, because, I mean, those are three questions um, that were asked about the diesel, and they're gone. <laughs> they weren't answered, you know, we, they weren't discussed, they didn't sink in. And so we, you know, those, these topics, you know, it's better if, if we're all discussing them. And I know that's what you guys asked for this time. So um, I'm definitely going to try to get us there. And, um, oh, Diana, you, you missed this morning. Um, it was awesome. We, we were talking about Sam and we all, we all pulled up. So, um, but yes, yeah, so, um, and I know you need to get to a call. So I'm going to, so yeah, I'm going to try to blow through this without punishing us. Um, so I do want to look at our equipment that we offer. Um, it's specifically for Alaska. It was made in the um, Arctic. It was made in the Arctic of Sweden. Um, these are composters that were designed for our temperate uh, climate. And then we have, um, I do want to look at waste analysis, data composition. We are taking that approach here in Southeast Alaska. In Alaska, it's hard to walk into a community when people don't know what their uh, what their volumes are and what the capacity is. And that's exactly what Diana was alluding to. That's what this RFP is going to be about: is what what scalability do we need to establish for infrastructure? One of the uh, so I think you were on the call with with Chris Cotta. Um, so this was just a couple of days ago. So we are going after some funding through the Denali Commission. And we are looking for regional uh, composition. So rather than us all fighting over the same pot of funds, which I think is crazy and I hate it, as, as all you know, even that USDA comp composting grant, so many people were going after it. And so the idea is that we can pull together for every community and that we can take these funds and we can apply them according to how many people are in each community so we can go after this data and we can justify state funding so that we can take care of the larger scale problem. So that that's the discussion that's happening behind the scenes. Um, Jennifer New is a part of that through SSP and Ecotrust. She's awesome. I couldn't even speak unless she <laughs> chimed in and got me on track every now and then. Um, 
And then so and then we'll go over some of the shipping waste and landfilling uh, real briefly. Um, we've already hit on it a whole bunch. My, uh, what I'm trying and what I, my campaign, my, uh, uh, what do they say with the evangelism is we need to get the word landfill out of our mouth. We need to, it was never intended in our societies and, and we let it go. It's, it's part of history and um, we need to turn our transfer stations into recycle centers. Um, and then of course the environmental and economic impacts, they're very different. And um, I, will, I will go ahead and just kind of share that my approach in this has not been an environmental stance. I'm a hippie at heart. I love the earth, I'm an earth child. I see climate crisis. But the second you say climate crisis to most audiences, they shut off. They're, they're no longer available. So, um, so what we do all relate to though is, is, the, is the economics. When I go to Kassan and I'm talking to Carol and she tells us that she's driving 45 minutes from Kassan to the AC store so that they can get produce, that's economics. You know, that's, that's logistics. And so that's the kind of things that we're like, okay, how do we decentralize decentralize this concept of landfilling, of waste, and of production. On one hand, we have a problem that is causing this global impact, and yet that same problem can be a solution for many of us in these small communities. I did get four years in Yakutat. I lived it, I felt it. I saw Larry Powell hustling. Here's a 75-year-old man. He's hustling to keep fresh produce in the, in the community and he does a good job. And when he passes, nobody knows who's gonna take his spot. He's got his grandson there, but these are the kinds of things that we're up against. And so talking to Kathy, um, there's all kinds of people. And so we're all talking about it, but it is very infantile. And so some of what you're doing, this is gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge. And I think it, it really is gonna take us into that next um, evolution where here, here we are on this fringe. And like this morning, we were all depressed because of the salmon. And yeah, the salmon go, it's, it's a snowball effect. So let's blow through slides. So I, I don't, I'm not gonna talk, I promise. Throw something at me if I keep talking after each slide, because there's about 150 of them. Um, but let's just, oh, is there a clicker? Well, will compost. Oh, no, I don't want to be a jerk. Oh. All right, here we go. Okay, yeah, so, so first off, um, so super appreciative for Clinkin and Haida. Um, so they we do want to start a recycling program and they have uh, cooperated with Totemic Solutions. And so we are going to be helping them set up. Um, in definite uh, respect, obviously, to Lisa. When Lisa heard that I was gonna be in Juno, we did get into it. We kind of went, we had words, we had some pretty hard emails. And over time, um, you know, we did get to talk and say, hey, you know what? Um, we do believe, both Lisa and myself believe in closed loop systems. So as Clinkett and Haida is taking care of their own tribal citizens, their own businesses, that that is the mentality that we really wanna move into in this evolution. So looking at smaller, rather than, again, one entity like a municipality trying to take over and trying to, you know, take on all of it, it's impossible. Nobody can do it. Lisa can't do it. She's amazing. She's an artist, but she shouldn't be a workhorse, right? We should all share that load together. And so definitely appreciative to Clinton and Hyde for taking that step. Looking forward to that relationship. And um, that's... Aha. Okay, sorry about that. So um, yeah, just a quick just a quick walk through into the uh, into the type of equipment that we're looking at. So this is our uh, this is our big hand. Now this is a two forty, and this is actually what um, Clinkin and Haida will be bringing in here. Um, we're going to be getting that ordered here shortly, and so just uh, go over a couple small points. So all of the models run on a 1.1 kilowatt motor. That's the answer for any diesel. It's very highly efficient. Um, some, in some cases, we're only using up to, uh, it's like one and a half to three kilowatts per day. 
that's um, that's efficiency. That's why uh, we really love these models because places like Cake, um, places like Yakutat, where rate consumption is so high that we don't want to bring in equipment and push equipment that's going to be burning up a lot of electricity. So these are very efficient. They can actually be run off grid. Um, they all have remote monitoring. We'll go over that a little bit. Um, stainless steel for the uh, for the climate. Um, they're all automated. They run 24 hours a day, completely uh, completely sealed, um, self-contained. Um, this really helps with the um, cross contamination that can come in when you have um, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, temperature. Um, and then protecting that pile, right? So we wanna protect that pile that's inside and make sure that those organisms are doing what they need to do and that they aren't hampered by the, uh, by the outer atmosphere. So, um, and then everything runs through a biofilter once uh, that's the exhaust. So you know that all, oh, it's, it's so much, <laughs> it's so much to go, to, go, to go through, but we'll, maybe I'll talk about the biofilter in a little bit, but, um, Let's, let's keep moving because we'll be here too long. So uh, just a couple examples of sizes and how they can look. So a small T120, that's actually up in Yakutat. Um, and then there's the Netter 20. This is in Acaruna, Spain. Um, so we did just do that tour over there and we got to see some of the more industrial equipment. That thing is, that's, that's kind of the granddaddy of, of engineering, so. Uh, wood chips go in that big hopper. It's got a, it's got an automated bin lift. It's got its own screen, um, and this is on site where the factory is actually. Uh, they're recycling all of their food waste, and then they're taking that food waste. They take it to their local farm. The farm grows food and donates it back to the factory, so they keep a small closed loop there. So, um, so there's this. Now these are our largest ones. There's only seven of these in the world. These are our Netter 36. And they will do just just about three tons per day. That's each of them. Um, and so the way these are set up is they're set up in tandem with one single uh, hopper and, and and feed. And um, so yeah, they uh, they're uh, they're 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 work workhorses here. So what do we got? There we go. So. Um, so there, yeah, there's another example. That's the inside. So you see ten sensors. Inside the drum, each one is monitored by a compost manager that's proprietary for, uh, for Burka. And so they're uh, monitoring um, CO2, oxygen, humidity, and temperature. And so that we are able to keep constant parameters on the beginning of the pile through the end. That way we know exactly if it has reached those peak temperatures. So we're looking for about 130 to 150 degrees, and we're able to maintain about 140 on average. And so if those parameters go out of whack, then it automatically lets us know, and I can get an alert right here in uh, Juno or Ketchikan. If that piece of machine is on the other side of the world, we're able to go on a cloud and we'll, we're able to help troubleshoot if there's a problem within the pile. And so it's nice to be able to be taken inside of the pile and so that we're actually, we, we're knowing what's going on in there. So um, pretty cool though, huh? That's a, that's a big one. So here's our control panels. Um, I did highlight the CO2. This is really, really, this is awesome. So this is new. The, uh, the ability to monitor our CO2, I feel like is very important in the modern day. Um, and what we're, and so the, the way it works is basically every, every compost pile is gonna be giving off emissions. And for the most part, it's natural. And we shouldn't fear CO2. We shouldn't fear methane, hydrogen sulfide. These are natural elements and, and there's nothing wrong with them but it's when we concentrate them and we put them in something like a landfill where they're not being uh, dealt with the way nature intended, that's when they become volatile. And so this gives us an advantage because we're able to concentrate the CO2 rather than in a large windrow where you have all of your emissions going right into the atmosphere, we're able to concentrate it and we're able to measure it coming out of the exhaust. And so we know the parts per million as it's being exhausted that's important because now we can concentrate the CO2 and we can reuse it. And that's another waste stream that we can, that we can capitalize on. We can use it for uh, greenhouses. We can use it for syngas, um, or we can at least 
uh, let the USDA know, let the EPA know, hey, this is exactly what we're producing. Um, so there's no questions on, on uh, how our emissions are looking. So, um, yep, yep, yep. Keep going, biofiltration. We do use an enzyme. So nothing, it's a sealed system. There's no ventilation. It has to go through the biofilter. The biofilter is filled with carbon. We do uh, do a living enzyme inside the biofilter and um, it keeps our odors down. So that's where, uh, um, so that's why we, a lot of these can be put indoors. These are set up in like lodges, hotels, uh, you know, and so this, this is the way that we're able to do that is through the biofilter. So this is um, how we mitigate odors and then other uh, uh, particulates. So, so I did want to show you guys the uh, T480. Um, so at the Akron Zoo, this is in Ohio. Um, this is a really cool showcase because they love it. They love their piece of equipment, so they've got uh, they got really nerdy with it. And um, let me go through some of these here. So they waited for us when we came. They had it nice and filled. This is their hopper. Um, so it's the zoo, so they're not just doing food waste. Believe it or not, they're also doing the bedding, all the manure, and then they're also able to do mortality composting, which means that the animals that pass away, because they do go through a lot of, uh, you know, birds, small rodents, things that, um, you know, they need to uh, properly dispose of that gets very hazardous if you're trying to burn or incinerate animals. And I don't know if you've ever looked at a farm and thought about, destroying a cow that's sick it's uh it, it it's pretty wild if you think about how much blood comes out of an animal and you know getting into bod's with wastewater um it's um uh, it's nice to be able to put it into a container <laughs> and have it break down in there than to have endless you know mounds of uh of wood chips to have to contend with so um so there's, they did save us a little bird there, but you can see all the trash, compostable bags. Um, and I love that. I love they filled it, up, filled it up with all those kinds of trash that you wouldn't think that you would want to compost, but they do it. And so there it is coming out the backside. Um, they, that's incorrect. They should, they should have that sealed. That shouldn't be open. Don't worry about it. Um, so, but when it is done, they do take it. We do, uh, we ask people to put it on open ground, all compost, regardless of how you, uh, um, regardless of how it's processed or what you're using, you do want to put it on open ground because you want it to be interactive with the earth. And so that creates an ecosystem of, of biology so that it can, uh, you know, where it can kind of live and then it starts to go through its curing process. Um, and, oh, there we go. So about three to eight months after it comes out of the composter. Now in the big Hannah's, the material is a slow compost. So it's going to be about, about eight to 11 weeks. And then you can push that to 12 weeks actually. So it gets almost three full months in the composter. Um, nobody else does that with their end vessels. Everyone's trying to do a rushed compost. The problem with when you're composting is you want it to be the natural process, which is slow. You can't rush it. You can't force compost because um, things need to degrade naturally. And as they're degrading and being pulled apart and as they're being consumed and, and, being, and it's amazing under a microscope, if you looked at what was actually happening, they, uh, the, um, Basically, if we want to get the material down to that humus, the fulvic acids and humic acids, you have to give it time. And so we want those three months, we want a complete degraded material. And then when it comes out, we let it rest so it can start to develop those other properties. Um, and that's how we make the best uh, growing mediums. So, um, uh, okay, so we do also do dehydration. This is the exact opposite of composting. And this is what we uh, we target these for. Um, let's burn through this real quick. So these we are looking for high volume generators. So this is what we're looking at for Safeways. This is what we're looking at for institutional kitchens, cruise ships, places that have high volume of production but very limited uh, um, uh, areas, so that they're you know they can't have compost piles. But you know if you've got a trash can, if you've got a if you've got a a dumpster, then you can have an in-vessel of some kind. And so by putting these dehydrators, we are able to reduce the waste up to 93% and, and it becomes shelf stable. 
So, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go over it on this. The D, these are awesome. They're easy to, are actually out of Korea. They're, they're, it's mandatory because in Korea, you've got 50 million people in a geographical area the size of half of California. And so since 2005, they haven't been allowed to uh, landfill. They have to dispose of their waste, and they have to use this or else they get cited. So hopefully we can get there one day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so they use things similar like this, and um, it helps make managing the material easy. Now, instead of a daily pickup, we, don't, we only have to pick up maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks. And you're not picking up filth and waste and rancid trash. You're picking up a valuable material that's clean, that's sterilized. And, and then that can be incorporated. So <clears throat> in Ketchikan, Sean from uh, Bodden Brewing, he'll be, uh, he's gonna be um, uh, getting one of these for his brewing waste. Um, he's got a bill of like $53,000 a year. And 90% of that is spent grain. And spent grain, when it comes out of the brewer's uh, pot, is so it's so good, it's so clean, but you only have, he says, about 12 hours before it starts taking on lactobacillus and it starts going fermented. And then it's no longer useful. So it has to be processed immediately. It doesn't have time for your local um, trash um, company to come and pick it up the next day. And he can't put it outside because the bears will get it. So this is the solution for those types of situations. And it, um, and we're looking forward to making dog biscuits and all kinds of, see, so there's how it looks. Um, so what's nice also about the dehydrators versus a lot of your anaerobic digesters, anaerobic digesters create gray water. And now you have to have a drain and you have another waste stream. And so although anaerobic digesters were kind of pushed by the Obama administration for the dairy problem with manure, um, they, uh, unfortunately, on a small scale, they don't really produce the energy that you would want. So um, I, I, let's just go back a little touch. So that is distilled water. That is the condensate that comes out of it. It does maintain 180 degree, 80 degrees inside the chamber. It does bring that temperature up to 500 degrees on an outer jacket. That's a patented um, heating system. The reason why that's substantial and important is because one of the problems in our food waste is, you know, it's uh, it's not just pathogens. So pathogens will be killed around 180 degrees, but um, at sustained temperatures. But what happens is we do get mycotoxins that get built up in our food. And what happens is, is when we degrade our food and then we go feed our chickens, well, then that passes into our animals. And that's known, so, so flocks and stuff, we'll, you'll see that. But so this type of technology at 500 degrees for a sustained temperature of at least 10 hours, it does take care of those aflatoxins. It does take care of some of those more um, persistent contaminants. So um, really taking care of a lot of those, you know, unforeseen that, um, you know, and obviously it's, it's all engineering. And so um, really just thankful for, you know, my, uh, the owner of the company that we're with, that he was able to get on board with these guys. So, um, so kind of cool, just, just more information on, um, so different sizes, we can go up to 2,200 pounds. We can get customized. We want to make fish meal, kelp meal, um, you know, a lot of different options. So, and we're going to be doing, so we are going to be doing some, uh, demonstrations in Ketchikan. So we, I got tired of talking about it because obviously I'm not the best presenter. So <laughs> I am a good worker though. So we're bringing this equipment into Ketchikan. It's actually on its way. And um, we're gonna be doing demonstrations so that we'll be able to show you guys what the material looks like when it's done. And um, so we do have static composters that we, that we like to set up. They're awesome. Those are each one and a half cubic feet. They break all the way down so that you can interact with the piles real easy, move them back and forth. Um, all kinds of doohickeys, and uh, we have a lot of different, you know, just just random things. Um, but we don't really focus on the. Um, we're, we're not. I'm not worried about some of the smaller stuff. We're, we're not. It's not. We're not trying to make a store here. So, and I'll get to that in just a second. But um, now the backyard bins are nice. Um, again, it's aesthetics. I'm a DIYer. I don't really need one of these. A lot of people like them. You know, and they are nice. They are they're easy to interact with, and um, 
for people that want them, we offer them. So, uh, but if, if, should I point at you or at the screen? Oh, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> okay, all right. So here, well, here's an example of where we did use those composters and they came in real handy. So we did a demonstration for K High down in, down in Ketchikan and that's Joey on the right in his uh, environmental class. So we got donations from Safeway, from Alaskan Proud and from um, the landing. We donated the dehydrate and then we got our wood chips from um, a Ramsey Tree Service. And so we set up three different stations for the kids. We ended up having like 70 kids come and that was super cool. And so they were all going crazy. We were doing quality control, trying to stop food fights. Um, oh, I'll just, and so, yeah, this is them kind of getting into it. Um, they actually had a really, really fun, uh, it was a really good time. It, it really was. And they asked a lot of the good questions. Um, they, I was not wanting them to fill up the composters, but they did. They jam packed them. Um, and then when it was done, they did a good job cleaning. So, um, it, it this uh, actually opened up the door. So I just got out of a meeting last week with the superintendent and with their um, uh, business operations manager and then the central kitchen. And so we are going to be conducting a composition for the district. And so looking at their central kitchen and everything that's coming downstream from the central kitchen. So and the idea is that we're going to be able to take their, uh, you know, take the cost of what they did last year, we're gonna compare them to the cost this year on diverting waste. And then they're gonna take that waste and incorporate it into, into curriculum for the kids. So they're gonna um, start using it for science and then for agricultural development. And so the kids are gonna be able to learn how to compost and why it's important. And then of course, um, you know, what to do with it. And so we'll be helping them with that. And it's a kind of a good example of, you see, that's one of our BCU units on the right. And you can see how much bigger it is. These are 100 gallon, but just to kind of give you, and actually for a compost pile, you kind of want to shoot for about one cubic yard. Diana alluded to getting it hot enough. And that's a lot of the problems when you're compost composting in your backyard, you aren't able to get those temperatures. So the larger bins, if you pack them, you'll be able to get the temperatures up. So more fun stuff just to kind of show you. I mean, I, I would love to have that thing. <laughs> we can move forward. <laughs> It's just a big grinder and it grinds all of your food waste through, you know, when you're going around town and then by the time you get there, everything's already blended. So let's go back for a second. So composition analysis and food waste audits. <clears throat> I'm very well aware that most of us are not ready to invest in large scale items. You know, even Juno compost or excuse me, CBJ still has to go through a lot of footwork in order to understand what the capacity is of what they need for infrastructure. So that's where this comes in. And that's what, um, as much as I would love to be able to, you know, be able to provide equipment, um, we have taken a step back in the company and said, we do need to look at capacity. And we need to, so we need to go, and I, we talked about it at the beginning. So that's, um, so that's why I did wanna share this. And so for every one of your communities, when you go back, you know, if this is something you wanna do, um, I don't have to be the point of contact, but you can you can reach out to me and we can start having these discussions more as a community, you know, rather than just a company coming in and trying to, you know, contract and, and fill all the contracts because it's just not a reality. So, um, so yeah, let's take a look at what we did with Safeway just real quick. That was also super fun. They were great. Oh man, the Safeway employees are hilarious. And, uh, but we can just blow through that real quick. That's fine. Just kind of throwing pictures out. There's the divert program. You can stop there for a second. So in the, so we separated the, uh, we did four different departments. We did the produce department, bakery, the butcher shop and the floral department. And one day in just the produce department, we separated 396 pounds of compostable material. And the only thing that was gonna go to the trash compactor was 14 pounds, 13 ounces. That was rubber gloves. That was, and I was very meticulous. That's why it was fun because the ladies were always laughing at me because I was pulling every rubber band, every glove out of the trash and trying my best to really get an idea of what was being generated. So, um, 
when I showed the store manager that she was pretty excited. And so we're, um, we're still looking to do this presentation for corporate. It'll be a little bit different. It's gonna be a lot of numbers and just spreadsheets, um, but I don't wanna bore you with that. So we can go to the next one. So yeah, um, and then Tom sent me this yesterday. I was like, ah, we'll throw it in because it, it is. It, it's uh, like, like I said at the beginning, we were never supposed to be landfill. This stuff was never supposed to go to landfill. There are some correlations <laughs> when you take a look at how topsoil is degrading on this planet and how we're destroying our farmlands. There is a direct correlation between the degradation of our topsoil and how much we're landfilling the food waste on the back end. And when you tie in, and I know I heard, Diana, I heard you say a little bit earlier that you didn't see this necessarily as, as, a, as, a, as an economic, as being lucrative. But when you do tie in the agri agricultural aspect, it becomes very lucrative and it's very impactful on an economic scale. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want to go through beginning to end looking at the petroleum fertilizers that are being created through ammonia and what we're doing with, with all of that, the shipping of all of it and all the, all the fuel that's costed. So the, again, decentralizing, this concept of decentralizing where our food is coming from, I'm not saying we got to do 100%. If we targeted 50%, that would change the planet. It would change everything. And we could. Southeast Alaska has the best water on the planet. What you need is soil and water. That's what you need for growing. And I know the weather is atrocious and it's difficult, but with those two things, we can create enough. We can, we, we can do it. Um, believe me, I experimented in Yakutat. <laughs> And, I, and we had success, we, we, we grew a lot of food and, and we put those plants to the test, taking all the you know, tops off, just letting the wind and rain just beat everything down and really like pushing, saying, hey, how, how, much, how much can this stuff take? So, um, so let's see, so, so wrapping on this up, I guess, I guess it really just comes down to, um, yeah, what do, you, what do you guys think? And, and, and what's your kind of, what's your input? Um, maybe take a minute and think about your community. I think the, this, this group right here, there's no sale on whether we need to do something about our waste. Um, but what are your thoughts on kind of what I was proposing as far as coming into each community and doing some of these compositions, doing some of these separations? It actually is pretty simple once you have cooperation. Um, so what are, what, are your, what are some of your thoughts? Um, and do you guys have questions? So, Carol. So I guess uh, one of my questions is, and it's a question that comes up in Kassan, is um, is there a difference between organic and non-organic food waste? Because this is a problem, well, not a problem, but it's just a big question in Kassan. We have people there who um, feel that if it's not organic, so it hasn't been sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, it's better for um, co composting or vermicomposting than when you just throw in anything that you get at the supermarket. Because we all know that a lot of the produce we get from the store has not only herbicides and pesticides, but also has coatings on it also. So how does this affect the quality of Absolutely. the stuff you're either composting or dehydrating. And, and so that's, um, that's, that is a great question. And so we're gonna have to wade through that. We, just like you saw at the Akron Zoo, we have to put it all in. We need to break it down. And once we start decentralizing where our food is coming from, we're gonna see less influence, remembering that those pesticides and herbicides and a lot of that is being put on our food for transport. So if we can cut out the transport, we don't need to have all those excessive. And if we have good quality soils, we're not gonna be as dependent on those. So it is a great question. I would say that if the world started like composting right now, everything, we would have a horror. It would be, it would be horrifying the, because we'd have to do the testing and I do encourage testing, but we're gonna see a lot of persistent contaminants in our food systems and it's gonna show itself. And, and I think that would be a good thing because it would, people would be like, whoa, you know, let's let's really take a step back. So, um, but um, I hate the word organic because of what we've done to it, right? 
I buy organic, but honestly, it's become this concept of whole foods and this segregation of only the privileged get to have the quality and, and, and the organic and, and all, you know, and then the, the, you know, the single mother has to have the WIC coupons, right? And she gets what's allotted to her. No, 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 no. Quality and healthy food need to be for all people. That's that should be the substandard. And then you might maybe your five star chef makes his little artistic meals for the, you know, for the rich. But quality food needs to be for all people and needs to be available. So I, I do struggle with the word organic because we've marketized it. We've, we've capitalized it. And it's, it's so um, um, but as far as your question goes, um, as far as what we can compost, we just have to do it. And, 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 we, and if you have a carrot and you're like, this is because you know the carrots are really susceptible for for pesticides. They're um, and then you just grow your own. <laughs> you just say, okay, we're going to grow our own, but we're not going to just grow a hobby garden. We're going to grow. We're 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 going to make food production, right? Because sand is going to do what sand can grow. Cloak, Craig, everyone is going, and then you guys, and then we can trade. And now we're not trading thousands of miles. We're just trading within our you know inner inner island network. So. Um, but uh, anyway, but is that is that kind of what you were kind of right? But by I me mean, now, right now, um, like in Kassan, you have people who buy organic and then people who don't. So, like I said, my problem is I have people in Kassan who refuse to compost if it's not an only organic compost. Sure. Okay. Um, and and do these um, machines do they um do they uh, get rid of the herbicides and the pesticides when it goes through there? And also I seen with a dehydrated food that it, you could use this animal feed. Correct. So, so in, in, in composting, what's going to degrade a lot of those contaminants is the biology. And that's why we we'll want to give it as much time in those microorganisms as possible, because they're the ones that are pulling apart a lot of those, um, um, a lot of those, um, uh, those long chains those long chains of contaminants that that are hard to break, but they break them. They break them down, and once they're able to to pull those, um, uh, uh, once they pull them apart, then they can be recategorized, right, in, into into new constitutes. And so we want to let the biology do it because that's their job. That's what they've been doing since the beginning of time. So we just want to make sure they get enough time, enough temperature. Um, and yes, there will be again. There, there, the you know polyfluoro, you know alkylcarbons. They're going to be there. Um, there are going to be persistent things, and we do want we do need to go after it. Your comment about the biochar, absolutely. Um, we 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 do want to take a look at these technologies and some of these innovations. Um, but we we have to wade through it, and then, and then just you know share with them and say, hey, what's the alternative? Okay, you don't want to compost it. We understand, but is it better to take it to the landfill? Is it better to spend all that money and and then and then to it would it's even more of a contaminant, and so but yes we want pure gardens we want pure soil we are far, we are a far cry from that, when it comes to the food that we're that's going through our our uh, refrigerators, um, it, it's a shame you know and then this morning that's all I can think I'm like, you know, natural right natural food you know salmon, the tree you know the berries and everything but. Um, that's not just who we are. We're cultivators. We've been cultivators from the beginning of time, you know, on, always. And so um, we can do it. You know, we we can do it. And we have wild and traditional harvests. So Flannery. Um, are, oh, are any of your projects that you're working with, are they testing their end product to just see if there's contamination that shouldn't be put back yeah, in absolutely. gardens, et cetera? Yeah. So yeah, I got some reports. Also, what are you testing for? What are, what contamination contaminants are they testing for? Uh, so I'm, I'll bring the I'll bring the reports for what they were doing over in in Sweden. Um, so those are some of the originals. So they were really they cared a lot more about it. Um, now for our dehydrators, we have from from the institute in New York, and they, they did go through. They went through. Um, um, gosh, I wish I could just. just but uh, it, it's pretty elaborate. But I would love to share that with you. Absolutely, and and and. What I want to do here, and part of what we're going to do in Ketchikan, is we're going to test. So that's part of what we're doing here. So that's it, it's we have to. We, we, and so yes, that's that's part of our campaign. And um, do you have like an idea in Ketchikan what you are going to be looking for? Like what contaminants are you concerned about that you're going to be testing for? If 
since this is a recent project. Right. So I'll, we'll be we'll be most concerned with with herbicides. Um, so the uh, the um, there, there's two of them, and so I'll, I'll I'll have to put them on my next slideshow. But um, the two that we would be concerned about that we see that we hear about popping up. Um, but the uh, you know. No, for the most part, we're going to look for for consultants for that, you know, and so we're going to be talking to the labs and saying, you know, you know, what do we want to monitor for, and then and then stick to it, um, and uh, so anyway, but but yeah, so and 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 so on as far as the composition that goes of the soil itself, that that's good and great. But what are your guys' thoughts on on actual waste volumes in your communities? and actually getting separations underway. Does anybody have any thoughts on actually conducting some of the some of the analysis on what's being shipped out, what's going to your landfills and do you have concerns about it? Is it is it a is it a priority um, to you? I know there's not a whole lot of you, but uh, but maybe representing each of your communities. Elizabeth Hi, thanks. Thanks for sharing, John. Um, I feel uh, connecting this back to what we were talking about earlier in some of our discussions about, you know, what would it take um, for us to have sustainable fisheries? And um, I kind of brought up the I brought up waste, and I feel like it's negligent that we don't take action to compost to you know separate our waste. Um, and like you said, landfills. Like, it's it's so crazy. Um, I mean, I wish the city, um, forget her name, Diana. Diana was still here. I mean, so many questions and comments, but I mean, at some point we're gonna have to start shipping our trash out. And um, I just feel like it's it's a waste of waste to not use, to not reuse it. And um, and you can cut down costs by, you know, cutting the the soil that gets shipped up too. It's like, we already have this. So um, I appreciate your work. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny after that we did the composition at Safeway, they they brought pallets full of of compost out front and 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 they were all sitting and I was like, are you kidding me? So we took a picture and I went I was, and she's like, I don't know what to do, you know, the store manager. And so, yeah. And so that's part of the report. And it's just like, you guys could make all your own compost right here and you'd be done. Carol, go ahead, go, go ahead or microphone. Well, I just want to say something about compost. Um, when you ship compost up from another state, from the lower 48, that's compost that's made in a different state out of different, you know, different things. Um, and it's not, you know, when you, when you do it here, most of it is, you know, you got your native bacteria here in our soils, in our area, Whereas if you get compost from Florida, you're basically bringing that bacteria from Florida up here. That's something I've learned. So composting up here in, in Alaska would be better um, doing it here because we are using our native bacteria that's in our soils and in, in the land here already, which is better for using what you're growing here. So I just want to throw that out. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. What about Clicken and Haida? You guys gonna do some compositions for your right for for the uh, I mean, because I know you guys have the you have your food cart, you've got the catering service. Are you guys gonna do? Um, are you guys gonna conduct an analysis, Ray, or, or sir? Well, I'll let as he he's kind of developing the program out. I'm just here to support him. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Click and Haida, we, as Ray mentioned, we are just getting started into this whole solid waste program. So um, I've been tasked with uh, starting, so we did a recycle, we started up a recycling program. Uh, we're just now, uh, we got awarded a, a composting as food waste reduction grant uh, this year. Um, but we're going to tie those into our greenhouse program uh, and also recycling program. So um, we're kind of going to try to just uh, mitigate Clinkin and Haida's organizational waste uh, by like what John showed, we are uh, 
partnering with John and uh, getting a big Hanna uh, shipped here and uh, starting a, a food waste reduction program here where like all of the, the this kitchen here as a catering business, a smokehouse catering, um, all the food waste that comes from like just the TNH offices, uh, traditional food security, uh, like the the fish we ate, like any anything like that that comes out of these uh, Clinkin and Hyda programs or office spaces, we'll be able to collect and then turn into a compost uh, product. Um, and then, then then we'll get a true idea of like what's the what's the footprint that Clinkin and Hyda is doing uh, here in, in locally. So um, and then that is just you know more data, more information we can use to expand to build out. Uh, but also hopefully serve as a model for other Southeast tribal communities to follow or, you know, that we could help assist, uh, get developed and started. Um, but that's kind of the, the plan. So this is just the first step of that is getting ourselves uh, uh, immersed in this this whole solid waste uh, program and project. And we're excited that there's already so much work being done uh, from other tribal communities. You know, Carol is doing great work, you know, Verma composting and composting. And I know Rango is doing great, Petersburg. Uh, Yakutat, they also have a, uh, a a big hand up there, I believe, as well. So um, and there, there's several other communities doing the same exact work, and uh, we just want to be able to tie everything together, all get on the same page, create a network, and just kind of be able to feed off each other so we can help address a lot of these issues that we've talked about. But um, yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell. And um, just a quick disclaimer, too. So right now, how we're approaching these projects is kind of a uh, capacity development aspect, almost like pilot project uh, approach in the same manner that we did with our greenhouse that we're, you guys hear about next. So we have a, a greenhouse, a geodome, and it's relatively small in comparison in comparison of what we're dreaming big to do. And so we're taking the same approach with the composter right now, uh, essentially like a pilot project, uh, learning how to build our capacity. And as that, as we figure that out more and start to get more resources behind that, we hope to expand that out into a, a bigger role where we're seeing, you know, warehouse style greenhouses, and that most likely would lead to yeah. a bigger composter. So maybe, uh, may, maybe let Clinkin and Haida be, maybe be the beacon here, and and as they're developing, you can reach out to them for information and for resources on if your community is interested in doing some separations and starting to gather data because that's what we need right now we don't need big machines and big infrastructure and big grants we need data and if we can get that data then we can justify more of the finances and things like that so i'll, I'll leave it at that and and um but yeah yeah if you're interested just to come and visit i love visiting places in southeast alaska so um we could just say hi do walkthroughs take pictures um, things like that. So just to kind of get the wheels get the wheels turning. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn off the microphone. Sound good. Thank you, John. Uh, and again, we'll have all his contact information. And uh, feel free to reach out to any of us here on our team um, if you have any questions or want to get in contact. Um, I know on the agenda we're a little behind, so we're just going to roll right into the final presentation of the day. Uh, we have Amy Erfling, our greenhouse uh, coordinator. Um, so thank you for being here, Amy. And after the presentation, uh, we will be finishing up, but we still have a, a good amount of uh, door prizes to give away and one that we're calling like the grand prize. Okay. A basket that was made by one yeah. of our uh, staff in NLR, um, Irene Lampy. Uh, there's a bunch of goodies in there from jams and what else? Yeah, 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 a lot of work that she did personally in there. So there's some cool stuff. Cool. Um, okay, well, I am Amy Erfling, and I am the Regional Greenhouse Coordinator for Clinkett and Haida. And I'm a horticulturist and a landscape designer as well. That's my educational and work experience background. And I did just want to address, um, I probably should have said this earlier, but Carol, your question about um, herbicides and pesticides and stuff being in compost. So there is specifically one classification of herbicide that I do know of, clopyrrolid, and that's like the classification then imidacloprolid that is commonly used on, it's commonly used on forage grasses. And so um, it does survive the composting process and also survives the gut of an animal. So we had this issue, I worked at a certified organic garden in Skagway for nine years and 
we had this issue come up with um we were seeing uh this weird twisting and like contortion of our plants and specifically in the solanaceae family so that's your like tomatoes potatoes peppers and it was uh we found out through NRCS we are working with Samia and that it was actually from straw that we had been using and getting from white horse in our um, chicken coops and so we are putting that in our compost and that it survived the composting process and um, and we were we were you know monitoring our compost getting it hot enough but that is one classification of herbicides that does survive composting process and the guts of animals so also, if you're getting like manure, but potentially that hay, um, so, you know, straw and hay. So if potentially that hay was used um, that had clopyrrolid and they had sprayed an herbicide on that, that herbicide on it, it also survives the gut of an animal and it could. So anyway, that's just one I know of, but I don't, I, I think a lot of other ones are actually, as far as I know, broken down in the composting process. But anyway, um, so. But to move on to greenhouses, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to uh, start with, oh no, is it really, is it on? Okay, so what better way to end an environmental conference and talk about controlling the environment? Um, so this is, when we talk about controlled environment agriculture, this is what we're talking about with greenhouses and also indoor growing. And um, it's really a technology-based growing that you're specifically trying to do environmental controls within your greenhouse or indoor growing to really optimize plant your plant um, crops. So what we do is we, uh, we're trying to control temperature, lighting, ventilation, and often you do enhance with carbon dioxide because that can increase your crop production by 30% if you are um, introducing carbon dioxide to your, at certain levels to your plants. Um, and then also through nutrient control, which it's generally hydroponics, aeroponics, aquaponics, or soil systems. And so these are a couple pictures that I have. These are places that I worked at. So on the right is, um, that's Kaufman Cove on Prince of Wales Island. It's a 7,000 square foot greenhouse run by the Southeast Island School District. And that's actually an aquaponics and hydroponic greenhouse. Um, so. They do have lighting. Uh, there is some ventilation. The temperature was actually controlled through the water, but it, the air was not um, temperature controlled aside from ventilation that was intake and exhaust fans. Um, and then nutrients, so it's aquaponics, so it's the fish are providing most of the nutrients, but then you do have to supplement with certain nutrients that you're not getting from the fish. Um, and the one on the left, that's in the Skagway Brewing Company. We, I helped them start an indoor aeroponic farm. And so that, you can see all the lighting. And then those are the plants that, so this is a 1,200 square foot indoor farm. Um, we did do air, aeroponics with this so that you can see the plant canopies. Those are out in the light, but then inside those little, they kind of look like we would call them mattresses. It kind of looks like a mattress and sandwiched in between that is where the roots are. And there's a mist that is being sprayed onto the plant roots uh, that is a nutrient rich mist. And so these types of systems have really high, oh, and also actually with this one, I do want to add is that this because this is a brewery, we were piping the carbon dioxide that was coming off of the brewing process into this room. And so that was really increasing our production um, for plants. And, and you can really increase it by 30% is what the figure out there is. But you, you really do have to watch out because he, the human levels that safe for humans is much lower than it is for plants. So we actually had like alarms in there. So I would know, you know, to potentially not enter that room if, if the levels were too high. Um, and these can be really high energy input systems but they also could be really highly productive per, per square foot. Um, so next slide, please. So kind of looking at the opposite side of this um, is regenerative agriculture. And this is probably what I've spent most of my career doing is um, really looking at how we can grow partnering with nature. It's a, a, a really holistic approach that you're nurturing and restoring soil health is your primary goal. 
and we had Sammy a talk about this earlier in the week. I think it was on Monday about the soil food web and um, how that's really all the microbes that are in our soils. That's really what we want to target in terms of promoting soil health and really nurturing and the, restoring the soil health. Um, it's fostering ecosystem relationships, planting biodiversity, integrating livestock, which can also you know, be chickens and ducks. It doesn't mean it has to be cattle and um, pigs and, um, and really using our local nutrient inputs such as compost and seaweed and fish waste, protecting water resources. And in these systems, especially in Southeast Alaska, doing season extension through high tunnels and caterpillar tunnels, which is more of like a three season growing and a four, but you can also do a four season harvest um, throughout the winter months. And this is really like a no or low energy input system type of growing. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what we're doing here with Klinkit and Haida that's super exciting. It's a uh, Tehit, I don't know if I said that right, which is gar uh, Garden House. And I think this is right, but the grants were awarded in 2020 and construction was completed in 2021. And I think was your first growing season 2021? I came on in 2023, so I'm not. Okay, potatoes and tomatoes in 2021. Um, and then obviously 2022, they grew. And then now we're at 2023 and I started in March of 2023. This is a 42 foot diameter dome from growing spaces, which is about 1300 square feet. There was a 20 foot diameter pond in it. And I had that removed by Brandy and I in June. And right now we only have about 350 square feet of growing beds. And so that's really only about a quarter of the you know, square footage in this dome that we're growing in. Um, it's a soil system, which I really love because I am much more of a soil person um, where we can be using a lot of our, our local nutrient inputs on this, in this um, greenhouse. We do have heat pumps for heat. As we're talking about that environmental control, there's heat pumps, there's intake and exhaust fans, and there's also subsoil piping that heats the soil on the perimeter beds with air. And then there's oscillating fans also for ventilation and um, horizontal airflow. Next slide, please. So this is in May. So we we start when I got here, I started seeding pretty much right away. I think, you know, I got here in March and uh, had got some seeds started. And then we planted in April. And then in May, this is what it looked like in May was our first round of harvests. Uh, we did radishes and a lot of greens, some herbs. Um, and then next up, you can see the spinach. Oh, and here you can see the pond actually. So that's a huge pond. It was never actually filled. So it was a pond that was supposed to be used for thermal mass. But I really found that in the climate here, we already have a really high humidity so it's just adding a lot of humidity and you can also use thermal mass with all of the the rock and the beds um, that have all this concrete around them that's also used as thermal mass so i opted and it was taking up a lot of space so i opted to take that out the pond um, and we took that out in june and then next slide so this is what we took that's in the center now we took that out and you can see one of the hair the hair pumps the, the uh, heat pumps there and then right in the back, um, kind of by those heat pumps are these black tubes that come up. And that, those are the fans that blow under, that's tubing that runs under the soil beds. And it's intaking air from, you know, the warm air from the greenhouse. And then it'll pump it under the soil beds. Our uh, solar panels were stolen that, that run those. So they're not in operation right now. But I'm hoping to get them in operation before uh, you know the temperature really starts getting colder. Um, but you can see in June we started getting a lot of really good growth on the plants. We were harvesting cucumbers, um, a lot of herbs, a lot of greens again, and then um, it just like we had all these green tomatoes and they just were not ripening. So then we get to July. Oh, sorry. Next slide, July. 
things were really, really popping. Um, I liked, to, I put in some flowers in there too. We don't have pollinators in there, but um, you know, there's certain flowers and things that are also good for pest deterrents. Um, and so next slide. Lots, lots of more plant growth. We have zucchinis and green onions and tomatoes and more tomatoes. And next slide. And then we started harvesting and we were getting tomatoes and more tomatoes and more tomatoes and more tomatoes and more tomatoes. But we also, it was, so it's been a great tomato harvest. It's probably also the amount of that I planted, but who doesn't love fresh tomatoes in Southeast Alaska? Um, but we do, you know, we have a lot of zucchini and cucumbers, lots of herbs. I mean, a lot of great things coming out of this greenhouse. And then August, we finally started getting peppers ripening. I'm super excited. So we've been have they were also green for a super long time, but we finally started getting peppers ripening, um, which is also, I mean, who doesn't love seeing peppers also in Southeast Alaska. Um, and then that, so this is kind of what it looks, this is what it looks like pretty much now. I did end up having to take the cucumbers out because we had a really bad leaf spot, which is a fungus that I didn't want to keep spreading. And it also, they were getting so tall that they were way up in the top of this um, this trellis and we couldn't even reach them anymore. And we were, so we were getting like really incomplete pollination. And so I opted to just take them out. And then I'm doing like a fall round of uh, sugar snap peas now in that, in this closer trellis. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at now. That And so next slide. So we've harvested so far this season. I decided to try warm season crops and cool season crops. Um, you know, some of these ones, like I did radishes really early season. Um, and most of the things, the cool season surprisingly have been doing pretty well. Um, I have been getting some bolting, which is when you, especially with like cool season crops and warm climates, you tend to get bolting, which means things that are like, that you don't want to be going to flower, like lettuces will suddenly bolt is what you call it and they start to go to flower and so we've I have seen some of that happening that did happen with our radishes um beets did okay carrots did okay um but surprisingly our like our collard greens and swiss chard and kale are doing really wonderfully in there and they have not been bolting and we've had some great warm season crops um the tomatoes has been a bumper crop Zucchini has also been doing re really well. I'm starting to see some um, more uh, molds and problems, you know, as we're getting in these cooler temperatures. Um, we do not have a dehumidifier in the greenhouse. And I think that will be crucial to try to get a dehumidifier in there because we are seeing really high humidity in the greenhouse. Um, and yeah, and cucumbers, peppers, and lots of herbs, a lot of basil, of course, I planted, but other herbs, we have rosemary and sage and thyme and oregano, cilantro, um, I did chamomile, yeah. So there's a lot of good thing, parsley, a lot of good things in there. Um, so next slide, please. And so now we've also started a regional community greenhouse program, which is primarily why I was hired on in, um, that's my position, regional greenhouse coordinator hired on in March of 2023. Um, this was from a, the TNH climate action plan that someone could probably speak a little bit. I have not actually read it yet, but um, it did specify installing greenhouses in Southeast communities throughout um, you know, in this, our Southeast Alaska communities to really increase food security and food sovereignty. This is a BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Grant. It was awarded, I guess I have, it was awarded in October of 2022. It's a category 10 implementation project and it's to help install greenhouses in three different communities in Southeast Alaska. And so right now we're looking at working with Wrangell and Skagway and Heidelberg on this project. And um, we're still, you know, things take a long time to get agreement signed and stuff like that. So we're still in that phase of really getting um, agreement signed. We did not do any kind of community assessments um, really prior to doing sort of initiating this um, grant. So we're also looking at, you know, it, like I know specifically in Skagway, we're not gonna do the dome. Um, we're choosing a different type of greenhouse. So 
the Tahit was used as really the pilot program for this, but we're also have that flexibility within this to make some changes based on what the community needs are and the, um, you know, the desires of what they what what they really want to be doing for growing in in these spaces. Moving on, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about you know some of the challenges and opportunities of greenhouses and specifically and also um, controlled environment agriculture. One of the big things that is a challenge, and you know this is differs in every single community, is the energy cost because it can be really highly energy intensive. Um, there's really high inputs of energy for a lot of these systems. And that you know can fluctuate with how, how much you are putting into it. But in order to really get them to be very highly productive, you do end up having to do a lot of um, equipment, I guess you'd say, in technology. Um, the cost of initial investments can be pretty challenging unless you have great grants for them. Um, climate control also, again, having more of this technology and equipment really helps control a good environment um, for crops. Nutrient management, um, it also, that is, can be another challenge because often you are bringing in inputs, you're in, bringing in inputs rather than using local resources. Um, pest and disease management can also be a challenge because it's a really closed system. So once you get aphids in there, you know, it's really hard to get rid of them because it's like it's closed um, and same with diseases. Crop diversity can also be challenging, um, which with the environment that you have there, especially, you know, more so when you're looking at a lot of the controlled environment agriculture that's like hydroponics and aeroponics, you're pretty much mainly doing greens and herbs and you might branch out into um you know cucumbers your trellising crops like cucumbers and tomatoes and um and then labor can also be a challenge because these systems generally are you know, more technology based you know it's not often your average grower that you're is you know is working with these systems um and in general and it's not just with greenhouses, but in general, we have a really lack of research and data for growing in Southeast Alaska. And again, it's not just in greenhouses, it's really a lot of the ag our agricultural systems. We just don't have a lot of research and data for Southeast Alaska because a lot of the, our growing in Alaska is you know, primarily done like Matsu Valley, Delta Junction. So there's a lot more research and data that's been done for um, those areas. But there's a lot of opportunities too. And a lot of these are the same opportunities. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones that we can see, of course, is that you you can grow for four seasons. And who doesn't love having fresh produce in the winter? Um, this offers our, you know, not just four seasons of growing, but you can help get season extension with your outdoor beds th through plant starts, um, being able to get them started in the greenhouse. Climate control is also, I see as an opportunity because when it's raining every day outside, you know, you can have a climate that you're actually working inside um, that you are, it's not raining. And also you can control, you know, the temperature and um, other the rest of the climate. Um, I also can see nutrient management using local inputs as an opportunity. You, you know, we can take these fish waste, this compost and seaweed and create local nutrients and i i've had a lot of farmer farmer friends say that they really wish we did have more local nutrients available in southeast alaska as a product that they can use on their farms in their greenhouses and the high tunnels so i really could see that as also an opportunity in you generally you're growing more high value crops and then this also local employment is an is an opportunity there's lots of opportunity for technology and science education with greenhouses and controlled environment agriculture and lots of and the health benefits. I mean, it's not just for having local nutritious food, but also, I mean, walking into one of these greenhouses, especially in the winter or when things are just not growing. I mean, it just really is like your spirit. It just really is such a health benefit for having these live plants around you. And then food security, of course, is huge opportunity. Next slide. 
So I wanted to especially talk about controlled environment agriculture and regenerative agriculture because having a resilient local food system, it really includes all scales and types of agriculture. You can't just have one and not the other. I see it as also including community gardens, community high tunnels and greenhouses. And I had to include this picture because I just think it's so cool. So this is the Inuvik community greenhouse. They took an old hockey arena and turned it into a community greenhouse. And so these are all beds that are run by, you know, different individuals in the community. And then they also have some um, beds that they're growing together to sell produce and then provide to like food banks and, and those, um, you know, in need. And so, you know, I also think it includes food forests, as we've heard, mariculture, aquaculture, subsistence foods, waste recovery, process, you know, processing and storage, such as root cellars, distribution and markets, workforce development, and it all boils down to really having these healthy ecosystems. And so, um, you know, and I said, I'm also a landscape designer. And next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> and really how I see it, one of the, um, I've, through education and work experience, I've really, my mind has been open to permaculture. And so one of their core philosophies is really meeting human needs through ecological and regenerative design. And I know someone earlier talked about using this word sustainability all the time. And I really see a word that we really should be using is regenerative because we need to not just, you know, sustain these systems. We really need to regenerate them and restore them. And that's all I have. And I would like to, um, I do have some questions though, if anybody, you know, wants to just have any kind of more discussion about really what kind of local agriculture exists in your community. Is there a need for crop production in your community and what crops would you like to see grown? Um, is the cost of energy really too prohibitive to growing crops year round in greenhouses and controlled environment agriculture? And I know we've talked a lot about other, um, you know, other things besides plants, but with regards to plants, really what concerns do you have for food security in your community? So if anybody has any questions or thoughts on that, um, I'd love to hear it. Carol. <laughs> buy a cucumber, thanks. Mm -hmm. You buy a cucumber at the store and you put it in your fridge and the next day it's already starting to rot. Yeah. So, um, and I, and I know cucumbers last longer than that because I had a friend down in Washington give me one out of her refrigerator and I brought it home and I put it in the fridge and I forgot about it. And then three weeks later, I'm like, oh crap, I forgot that cucumber and I pulled it out, but it was still good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for us and, and it's right now it's really cost prohibitive. I mean, the price of, of, of fresh produce is going up every day. And so, um, things like tomatoes and cucumbers and, you know, things you can make a salad out of that, okay. you know, um, that, you know, that's fresh and nutritious, mm -hmm. that's nutritious. And we know where it comes from and it's, you know, from our own hard work. So, you know, that's what we're looking at. Yeah. You know, and I think what's difficult also what you're saying, like the cost of stuff in the grocery store, but you know, the, it's hard because the cost, like I, I know from growing up here for the past 13 years is that most farmers and who are growing crops up here are actually not even calculating their labor into what is, is going when they're pricing out what they're selling locally, they're not even putting their labor into that. And so, you know, I, unfortunately, I, I think it's almost even less expensive still to sh ship stuff up here. I mean, not that that can't change. Um, you know, I, I would love to see that, you know, with big ag, there's all these subsidies of, you know, and that's why a lot of our food is so cheap, but, um, but we don't have that here with, you know, a lot of the smaller agriculture here. So. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I totally agree with that. I mean, I'd love to see more local nutritious, you know, local food that's nutritious. And do you you guys have a greenhouse there, don't you? This Yeah. Is it and that is heated, isn't it? In the in Kasan? Yeah. Okay. So they can grow like tomatoes and pepper. Do they grow year round? No. Okay. 
Amy, really quickly, something to add to that on the economic aspect of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is a cost, but one thing we have an advantage of as tribes and organizations being able to apply for grants that help offset that. Yeah. So when we use Definitely. those grants, it also has the opportunity to create some revenue behind it or whatever else, but there is that resource for tribes and tribal organizations who are looking to do food sovereignty programs. So it helps alleviate some of the the, the cost effects on it. Yeah, I agree. Sorry about that. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Or, uh, well, I was just wondering well, on <laughs> if, if, I don't know if this is a question for you or for Clinton and Haida, but would you be willing to share your overhead costs, your development costs, and some of your projections on, and, and would you be able to share that with us for development on what it takes? Because what you're doing is so beautiful. I mean, it's wonderful, but what it takes to actually make that happen. Yeah, I think, you know, I do know one thing that I am going to have the, um, the the dome sub metered because we don't actually know what the energy cost of that is right now um and we need to find that out and that's what you know a lot of these what i was talking about not really having that research and data available like i think that's really important also moving forward in the regional greenhouse program is is making sure that the greenhouses that we do help install that we are also requiring that they do some record, you know, record keeping and reporting for us in terms of knowing what energy costs there are, what labor costs there are um, that are going into the into these greenhouses as well. And, and to add to that, and, I I will say yes. Our our goal is to ensure that we're helping not just build our capacity, but other tribes and communities' capacity. So whatever we can do on that regards, sharing whatever information we have, we will be happy to do so. Yeah. Part of that, what about um, some classes? Would you be willing to teach some classes for others who are wanting to start production? Yeah, so we are. Um, I mean, I'm hoping we're, <laughs> we're just getting started with, but I mean, I think this fall right now, I'm looking at wanting to do at least here, um, and hopefully Darren Snyder, I think might be helping. He's a UAF extension agent, is looking at doing um, a soil building, like a sheet mulching soil building, Hugel Culture workshop, because what I didn't po point out is, so uh, I forgot to add this into my, but behind Tehit, we're looking, and in front of it, we're looking at doing some outdoor beds, and we're going to need to build soil for those beds. Um, I mean, we can import some amount, but I'd like to do a workshop on how doing like sheet mulching and Hugel Culture um, for where for those areas because that's more of like an outdoor uh raised bed and um system is that we'll have out there and then next year i think it'd be great if we can do some more um workshops and classes on uh i mean we we do that's also one of the reasons i kind of took out the pond too is that we wanted to be an educational space but there really wasn't much space to gather in there's like kind of like little spaces to gather, but um, I think that will be a nice big space to be able to do things like seed starting and, um, you know, maybe Carol and I were discussing worms, of course, and, um, you know, and seed saving and some other things like that. Yeah. And, you know, composting, we'd love to get some input on composting because we're getting hopefully a bin, some bins out there for doing more of like home composting rather than like the big, you know, in vessel composting. And definitely we'll always, you know, listen to what the tribes are asking for. And if they're looking for workshops, yeah. we will yeah. definitely do our research to find grant money to ensure that we're hosting yeah. a workshop on on the requests and the needs of the tribes. And subjects too, like what exactly. is what is of interest, you know. I right. mean, I could spiel on about things that if you don't really care about it, you know, like yeah. Any other questions? Or yeah, or talk about what you have going on. I'd love to hear that. I'm from Klawak and oh. um, we had another program that built a department that built a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of greenhouse it is, but it's clear and you could see through it. And I don't know if he just ran out of funding to keep it going, but it's not even being used in Klawak. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. And yeah. Then there's a I don't know about that one. Yeah. Snow. When it snowed, it caved in the top part a little bit. So I don't know what 
kind of condition it's in. Oh no. Or if it's okay. Worth saving and where to get funds. Okay. To hire somebody or something. Yeah. Because okay. I know we don't have, um, in our work plan we don't have you know the employees to you know do stuff like that there. Yeah. Just thought I'd. Was it ever offer? I'm just curious. Like, was it ever was was there ever any growing going on in it at I, any point in time? I'm not too sure. I know okay. the guy was gonna try to um, grow clinket potatoes, mm -hmm. and it, it's up on a hill, and I can't walk up that hill. So, huh? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm clueless to what we should do with it. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. I'd definitely be curious to talk to, to you more about you know what is happening with that or connecting to see you know. Who might know more about what is going on with that greenhouse? Um, Quinn Abadera, and he's with the SSP program. Oh. Okay, I'll have to write. I, sh I didn't bring a pen up here, but I'll have to write that down. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that's hard. I have, I've been in many different locations in Southeast Alaska, unfortunately, and seen a lot of greenhouses that are sitting empty or storage units or have, you know, fallen apart. And, it, you know, it does take a lot of effort to keep growing in these and, and, you know, I don't know if it's so much, I don't know if it's the labor is just not there, the desire is not there, because it seems like everybody does want fresh produce and, and you know, where that's breaking down. I, I just, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, thank you. It was nice talking to you all. And <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time again out of your busy schedules to be a part of the Southeast Environmental Conference this week. Um, greatly appreciate it. Those who are traveling, safe travels home. Um, those who are staying here for the week, enjoy your weekend. It's a long weekend. Um, I want to let you guys know too that this is again, this is a an annual event. And we we in order to host these, we work with the other tribes to see what they're looking for, how they want to approach this. And so we'll be putting together again a, a planning committee for the Southeast Tribal Environmental Forum next year, probably around February and March. And um, we're hoping to see, you know, what what you guys may where you may want to see it at. You know, um, in the past we've done them in Ketchikan, Wrangell, and Craig. Uh, before COVID, we had we were preparing to do it in Haines. Um, so, yeah. Pay attention on the planning committee. We want to open it up and see what the needs are, what what your wants are, and hopefully we can get that done and next year have a an awesome form of, again. Looks like we have a lot of gifts to give away. All right. Oh, really quickly, sorry. Um, in regards to the presentations and the PowerPoints and all that stuff, we will be getting that to you guys um, if within a couple of weeks. All those who have signed up, have their email address, have an address on there. We're trying to figure out the best approach to to getting those PowerPoints and all those presentations to you guys. In the past, we've done them on jump drives and just sent those out. We may look to see another approach. Um, one approach was putting them all on YouTube and just being able to stream. But there's also handout materials that I know that people wanting. So. We're, we're going to try and look at the best approach for you guys to to get you all the information and everything from this week. Anything else I'm forgetting, Lindsay, sir? All right. And now for the final gifts. All right. Let's do a shirt. 0813. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I see your comment online. All right, let's do the hydro flask. 
and that's pretty cool. I see that they put our design uh, on these hydro flasks, and that must have just been done within the last two days or something like that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, Sam texted me this morning and said he had a little bit of time, so he was testing it out. Right on. Yeah. All right, zero eight one zero. All right. Zero eight two one. Zero eight two six. Someone can pretend. I don't think anyone's gonna know. No, I just get it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Zero eight one four. Yay! And are you pretending? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, let's do the plate bowl and mug. Zero seven eight seven. Tyler. Now, when you go camping. Your second. You got the other one? Give her something else. Give her something else then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. All right. Zero eight two seven. Nice. Yay. <laughs> All right. Let's do the, what is this? Adhesive, instant fabric and leather adhesive. Oh, it's a tear mender, gotcha. 0797. I'll throw a water bottle with that. Too. Oh, oh yeah. wiener, wiener. Yay. All right, we're gonna do a radio and a water bottle for the next two, 0818. How many are left in here? <laughs> 0819. 0820. <laughs> nice. Zero eight one seven. Yeah, yeah. Yay. Grand All right. prize. Looks like we're down to the grand prize. Let me tell you guys what Irene put in here. Smoked sockeye, salmon berry jam, blueberry rhubarb jam, chill cat earrings. All right. No. <laughs> this is donated by Irene. She's one of our, our she's our realty specialist. 0823. Nice, Jason. Yeah, all right. Yeah, we barred ourselves from winning these cool prizes. 0792. Oh, I thought you were I thought you're ready to claim your prize, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just 0799. Oh no. Oh no. Are you sure? Okay. Very generous of you.
Yeah. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Zero eight zero four. No, there's not many left in here. Zero eight one one. Yay, Yay Jen. Jen. Nice, Jen. I forgot a couple things really quickly. I, I first want to acknowledge um, my aunt Vicky, my aunt Alina and sir's mom carol for uh coming in giving us support here at the teenage staff thank you guys greatly appreciate it and the participation behind it greatly appreciate it i also want to thank carrie lamphere for um working with us here um for the past couple of years really she's been an amazing asset to the conference and helping us get this going without your help thank you carrie it wouldn't be as great as it is and then of course to Sir, Lindsay, Brandy, Jesse, who you guys didn't get to meet, Jesse, um, yeah, you know, Jesse, Jesse Indert started with us back in May, and she's been a big helping it in this conference going, as well as Jason and Amy and the rest of the teenage staff, Dominique, Tia, uh, Mary Rivera, um, yeah. And then, of course, our leadership, Desiree, Rold, and President Peterson. Um, yeah, without their support, and Vice President Jackie Peta for opening as well. <laughs> yeah, a lot of thank yous. And um, yeah, with that though, let's go ahead and adjourn and safe travels home. Enjoy your weekend, long weekend. Goodness, sheesh.